So, uh, hi, I'm David Corbett. Um, a very well welcome, warm welcome to the Courtauld um, and to the Courtauld Centre for American Art, which I represent. The centre uh, exists to support and develop research in the field of American art of all periods, from the earliest moment to the present day, and its international, transnational, and global contexts, um, and with as generous and wide a definition of what constitutes American art as we, as we can possibly manage to have. The centre hosts a library programme of lectures, workshops, conferences, symposia on American art every year. And we're delighted to be hosting this conference, Relatedness in Historic Orographies of North American Art, uh, organised by Emily Burns, Director of the Charles M. Russell Centre for the Study of the Art of the American West at the University of Oklahoma. This is a fourth and final event uh, in Emily's series on belatedness, which I guess some of you would have been following. Uh, all the others have been online, and it's a real pleasure to have this one uh, in person here in London uh, as the final uh, culminating uh, moment in that series. Thank you very much. We extend our grateful thanks to the University of Oklahoma for joint support of the conference. Um, and I'd also like to thank Acacia Finbo and the Courtauld's Research Forum team, who've expertly steered the administrative side of the conference through to completion. Um, now, I, I need to make a few housekeeping announcements before we start. Um, and I think this last time we had a conference here and uh, began with the fire alarm. If the fire alarm goes off, it is a genuine event. It's not a drill. And Please evacuate. And it promptly went off. And it happened. <laughs> Never happened before. It happened last time. Um, so uh, I say that with sincerity. If the fire alarm goes off, we're going to have to evacuate. We'll end up in the car park uh, down below. Um, wi Fi, if you go to the Courtauld uh, landing page for Wi Fi, it will ask you to register as a visitor. It's very straightforward to do that. Um, there are loops, one floor up on floor three, one floor down on floor one, and uh, there is a accessible toilet as well on this floor, which is signposted. You're very welcome to sit in the garden um, uh, during the lunch, during the uh, breaks for lunch tomorrow or refreshment uh, today, um, or indeed go up to floor three where there is a large common room which is cooler. You know, please. Please take advantage of that if you'd like to. Um, a bit later on, we have a coffee break, uh, and that will be just going out of this door, turn right, a couple of doors along is the research forum seminar room, uh, and that will also be in use tomorrow. Um, finally, it might be worth pointing out that uh, student staff for the conference are in yellow t shirts. Uh, if anyone needs help or directions, please do ask me, ask Emily, um, or the students. Thanks very much. That's the end of the, the housekeeping side of things. Um, welcome again, and it's a great pleasure to hand over to Emily now to introduce the conference. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here uh, for the culmination of the 2022-23 Courtauld Institute of Art series of events on belatedness and North American art, a symposium thinking about the historiography of North American art through the lens of cultural projections of being behind, without history, and without tradition. The series considers the cultural politics between so-called old and new worlds, and within cultures and nations of North America, the baggage of temporalities, the tensions between normative time and progress and its alternatives, and the writing of histories of North American art within the field of art history as a whole. This set of events has identified and critiqued the myths around newness that have constructed a sense of North American cultural belatedness from various angles by exploring the impacts that myths have made on three subtopics that were hosted in online roundtables, which included anachronisms in art objects, transnational exhibition histories and reception, and American Impressionisms broadly defined. Over the next two days, we will turn the kaleidoscope to art historiography. 
Um, just another housekeeping note since it's warm in here, I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that there's also a water cooler right outside of these doors. So if you need some cool water, please help yourselves to that. Um, I would like to thank David Peters Corbett for the invitation to conceive and develop this series, a project we've been discussing since the spring of 2021, and I'll tell you more about that genesis in a few minutes. Both the planning conversations and the events themselves have fueled an unfolding conversation around this complex, layered, capacious, and at times unwieldy theme. Uh, before I continue with my thanks for this symposium, I want to pause for a moment of celebration for David, because this will be the last in a long line of illustrious and layered symposia and workshops in his capacity as the director of the Center for American Art here at the Courtauld, a position he took up in 2016. In the fall, he'll turn his attention to his research practices and, and continue teaching. I went back over the center's list of events that have taken place over his inaugural stewardship, and it includes more than 90 events, David, <laughs> addressing US and European modern art histories, historical and contemporary art, and key pressing topics in the field related to materiality, transnational exchange, race and gender identities, politics, both in informal and workshop formats. It's really incredible, all of the, the array and um, range of conversations. The fields of American art and 19th century art have benefited immensely from his attention, his incisive themes, and support for historiographic conversations on these interwoven fields. Um, and I'll note a few that I attended um, and learned so much at, uh, the Writing Impressionism Into and Out of Art History, 1874 to today, which was in 2017, <laughs> and also the Crossing Borders Constructing Canons post-impressionism in Britain, America, and beyond in 2021. And then, of course, this conference, uh, Belatedness and Historiographies of North American Art. So I hope you'll join me in a hearty thank you to David for all of this tremendous offering to the field. My thanks to the Center for American Art at the Portal Institute of Art for sponsoring the series. I also want to thank Acacia Finbo, who is not in the room with us, um, but I'm sure you'll meet her over the course of the day. Um, and also the team at the Research Forum here, Amy, who's uh, helping us with the uh, digital uh, today, um, for all of their tenacious and detail-oriented management and support of these events, and the University of Oklahoma for subsidizing our conference dinner for speakers. The four events of this series have comprised 24 speakers, and I want to thank everyone who participated in the online uh, sessions, which were um, productive and generative, um, and these are accessible on YouTube if you'd like to go back and watch them. And then I also want to thank the nine of you who will be presenting over the next two days. I also want to thank the audience for joining us and in advance for your insightful questions and comments. Now I want to introduce some of the big themes of this conference um, so that we all have the same kind of foundation as we um, listen to today's talks. The questions that the series has centered are, what is belatedness? How has this concept framed through constructs of being behind, delayed, and not yet arrived shaped the arts and historiography of the arts of North America? These questions emerged through my ongoing book project, which is on the US artist colony in Pont de Siècle, Paris which argues that the majority of the thousands of US artists who studied in Paris performed a studied and self-conscious cultural immaturity that pandered to European expectations that the United States lacked history, tradition, and culture. The project traces a visual and verbal culture of naivete that many US artists and writers projected through art practice and social performance. The first chapter of the book, which is the last one I'm writing, which is entitled Belated, charts constructions of US naivete in Paris from Benjamin Franklin to Mark Twain and Henry James to analyze an affect of outsiderness that frequently posed a sense of cultural delay, a strategic and willful temporal lag that probed and then often inverted the liability of being perceived as culturally innocent into an asset. This Franco-American transactional relationship through culture resonates with the concept of belatedness in at least two competing ways. First, by framing US art as delayed and behind, French observers clarified their <coughs> own cultural hege hegemony. This model is akin to Harold Bloom's reading in The Anxiety of Influence of 1973, 
where relatedness in poetry structured anxieties that possible creative avenues had been dried up by other artists. Second, by taking up and refracting these stereotypes, US artists and critics sometimes dislodged them for cultural gain, building what Jeffrey Batchen has discussed as inversion theory in an essay about local modernism in Australia, where artists play with the structures of provincialism to, quote, take an apparently fatal flaw and make it a strength. In the process of playing useful and mobilizing American futurity, US artists in Paris participated in claims about their own belatedness or delay. The American studies scholar Bert Hertzogenrath argues in an essay from 2001, The American Adam Revisited, American Literature, National Identity, and the Logic of Belatedness, that an obsession with being new and cutting edge in the United States, perpetual affirmations of new nationhood that I still hear claimed today, um, produced anxiety about being behind, a feedback loop that propelled a sense of belatedness. Using psychoanalysis building on Freud's idea of afterwardness, resulting from belated or deferred understandings of, understandings of trauma, and deconstruction, Hertzog and Rath interprets the myth of the American Adam as an icon of a, quote, curious temporality, simultaneously moving backward and forward. He argues that in US artists' retroactive insistence on origin stories that privilege narratives of the United States as a new Eden, they reveal their, quote, belated construction of a necessary origin. Hertzog and Rath sees this as a, quote, effect that presupposes itself as a self-perpetuating cause in a circular structure of signifier and symbol, in building a myth that erases its own traces. For Herzog and Rath, belatedness undergirds both the anxious desire to engage in origin building, to insist upon newness and unencumberedness, and its temporally disjointed retroactive construction, intermingling, making, and reception. With attention fixed on futurity, U.S. cultural producers often found that their quest for the new is perpetually deferred. The emerging paradox is that, rushing to be early, artists find themselves anxious about being late, resulting in an uneasy sense of being behind the trajectory of time instead of on the cusp of it. For Hertzog and Rath, this temporal slippage of belatedness operates through push-pull dialectics between the cultural tropes of new and early and the anxiety of tardiness. And one example that Hertzog and Rath takes up is Jacques Derrida's notion of fabulous retroactivity, which traces the tautologies in the signing of the US Declaration of Independence, because in Derrida's terms, the quote, signature invents the signer, authentic authenticating this document only retrospectively. Building on these thinkers, we might define belatedness as a constructed myth of delay, a self-consciousness of where one sits in relational time and in cultural dialogue, and a strategy for both imposing and countering systems of power. In this later, latter trajectory, we can link the inquiry to ongoing conversations that are spotlighting tenacious concepts of linear time as only one dominant method for experiencing the world and for writing histories, one that is tied to Western, Euro-US, and cisgendered normative constructs. The term belated implies an ontology of being tardy, but the question of on whose timeline uh, one travels uh, with it. Applying this to art history, belatedness might be traced both within objects and within the writing about them. Belatedness is always relational and can operate, as this series is showing, within objects, exhibitions, criticism, and historiography. Like many myths, like innocence too, it is a transitive and fluid concept that reaffirms itself iteratively. While my thinking about this frame emerged from this historical discourse in the US colony in Paris, it's clear to me that this relational concept, both denigrating and idealized, has implications beyond my specific case study and beyond Hertzog and Rath's foundational analysis. Um, and just to give you the kind of backstory of um, the genesis of this conference, I developed a study day as part of my Terra Foundation for American Art visiting professorship at the University of Oxford in 2020-21 and had a conversation with Jeff Batchen about whether to take up a safe topic for my uh, study day, which would have been Americans in Paris, or the more intellectually adventurous but less predictable topic on the fungible concept of belatedness. Um, and like any good mentor, um, he steered me toward the riskier uh, but more rewarding uncertainties of the belated. 
So in spring 2021, I organized a, a study day called Belatedness, Coloniality, Modernity, which explored this concept as both an imposition and a mantra on a more global scale, thinking about a variety of global modernisms from Dakota painter Oscar Howe uh, to um, Australia um, in writing, uh, to British anxieties in the Ottoman Empire, to Gauguin's Tahiti, to constructions of Russian modernism. Um, and the session affirms the relational imposition of cultural tardiness, what Joshua Cohen has productively explored as a décalage, a term for jet lag that represents a game of catch up uh, in which, um, in the case of Cohen's work, contemporary African artists are made to perpetually chase after Western advances. As linked with mo movements of Euro-US colonialisms, and there were a few instances in this discussion too of artists productively taking up and performing back these um, concepts, especially in emergent national contexts. This conversation prompted mine and David's planning for this series, um, focusing on North American art and this um, thread, to think about how these have been, both um, in North American art and history, been culturally, uh, historically denigrated, but also celebrated through these ironically long-standing charges that parts of the continent were young without history and tradition compared with Europe. And um, this conference really focuses in on how these ideas resonate differently related to the cultures of the United States, Canada, Mexico, indigenous nations, and the Caribbean, as well as other modern transnational contexts. One of the key questions here will be to think through how historical constructions, impositions, and performances of belatedness may have shaped the writing of art history related to the art of North America, again broadly defined. How has this idea shaped the field of North American art history, the inclusions and exclusions of its canon, um, especially within art history's attention to narratives of aesthetic progress. Where is it ruptured or challenged? In the talks that follow, these four sessions will pull apart threads and traces of relatedness as it has informed um, North American art production and the writing of North American art histories. I've arranged these sessions thematically to consider first relatedness and constructions of deliberate difference, relatedness as positionality, related inclusions in historiography, and finally, belatedness and North American art histories. I will introduce the full slate of speakers um, on each panel uh, briefly at the start by their title, institution, and I'll mention one of their publications that has really resonated with the themes of this conference. Um, but I encourage you to look to their website for, uh, to the conference website for their full bios and lists of, tr a tremendous list of publications. Um, and discussion will occur after each set of talks. Um, so on our first panel, um, we have two speakers. Um, the first will be Emmanuel Ortega, who is the Maryland Loma Scholar in Art of the Spanish North Americas and Assistant Professor in the School of Art and Art History at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And a publication of Emmanuel's that I wanted to mention is an article published in Art Bulletin in 2021 called The Mexican Picturesque and the Sentimental Nation, a study in 19th century landscape. And this article argues that conventions of picturesque landscape painting in Mexico operated in the incipient nation as a strategy of self-definition that carefully sidelined indigenous populations while claiming to celebrate them. Um, and his talk will be called From New Spain to Mexico, Relatedness as a Tool of Empire. And then second, we'll have Alexis Boylan, who is a professor in the Art and Art History Department and the African Africana Studies Institute at the University of Connecticut. Um, one of Alexis's recent publications um, by MIT Press, a book called Visual Culture, and this is a must read for students um, in, uh, in visual studies. Um, Alexis insists upon the tension between how images self-naturalize um, when they are actually, and I'm quoting from her, never innocent. She probes, how are we to think about the guilt or innocence of the visual in any given situation? And this knowing intervention embedded in images and objects is really crucial to my own thinking about cultural innocence and relatedness. Um, and her talk will be called, Always Late to the Party, North American Art, science, and epistemological anxiety in the early 20th century. So with that, I'll invite Emmanuel up to the stage. Thank you. So uh, this is a little bit of a survey of how um, painting has always been at the service of empire in Mexico since 1521. So we're going to go through 
100 years or so of, of history. In 1854, an identified art critic for the Mexican newspaper, El Universal, lamented the state of the fine arts in the country. He noted, It is necessary not to have illusions about the promotion that our society is likely to give to the fine arts. In this respect, we will confess with horror that we are still far beyond. In the 19th century, Mexico supposed the lateness in relation to the creation, administration, and application of the so-called fine arts depended on developing a unique national artistic language. As a tool of empire, Critics and artists understood the need to amplify the role of the arts in the articulation of a new nation. The art critic continues. 200 years ago, painting and sculpture were undoubtedly protected in Mexico in a much more effective way than they are today. The enthusiasm that reigns today in matters of fine arts is much greater, or at least it is explained more loudly than before. But its fruits are measured on an infinitely smaller scale and the protection that results in artists is almost null. This perceived belatedness stemmed from an internal need to place Mexico in a global cultural conversation. The country's progress depended on its cultural movements, much, much as it had for 200 years before its independence. <coughs> this presentation will trace the ways in which painting practices of central Mexico have always co-opted European styles, quote unquote, belatedly, in the service of empire and nation building. Following a pattern of novo Hispanic institutions, 200 year insistence of mannerist painting, romanticism also thrived in Mexico well past its European apogee in the late 1800s, reaffirming the ongoing relationship between painting and empire in Mexico. So in the beginning, during the first waves of colonization, missionaries in the Americas imported didactic religious European imagery to be adopted for the conversion of local peoples. From its introduction in New Spain, religious painting was constituted by what I call the art of copying and the rhetoric of translation. The art of copying was the formal integration of conventions of European printed images to American murals and canvases with orthodox clarity and unmistakable legib legil legibility. The integrity of the rhetoric of translation depended on its uninterrupted usefulness in spiritual conversion. 16th century friar Peter of Ghent, who established San Jose de los Naturales, a school of art in the recently conquered city of Mexico, with the purpose of instructing natives in the art principles of the Renaissance, inaugurated the statutes of novo Hispanic hegemonic painting. For 300 years, these stipulations were contingent on European treatises, inquisitorial regulations, and most importantly, a guild system. There are provisions designed to maintain a hierarchical operation. As an inaugural practice, indigenized artists were tasked to copy, enlarge, and synthesize black and white prints into a mural system that serve as a backdrop to an aggressive conversion campaign. Indigenized subjects were quickly dominating the art of copy, but were also socially limited. The integrity of the printed culture in which they based their murals was to be left intact, altered only as, as long as it did not betray its final, final purpose, that is, as a doctrinal tool in the conversion machine. Despite the irony of these artistic traditions, were perfected as tools of epistemic destruction by indigenized peoples themselves, they must also be considered, considered as resistant strategies. Their potentiality to adapt to changing paradigms in image making were a means to survive the will of empire. Indigenized subjects enter the history of European painting with severe guild limitations and with the advent of royal ordinances restricting their participation in official and ecclesiastic commissions, not at all. Our historian Fatima Malcon details the structure of these colonial organizations. Quote, in the beginning, 
This gives control the artist's capacity to develop their activities and always procure official recognition, which most of the times society negated." End of quote. Alcon highlights how the proliferation of guilds reached its high point by the middle of the 18th century, when about 200 of these operated in New Spain. The official restrictions imposed upon locals, which was a process that began with their monastic <coughs> translations of European engravings, effectively opened the stage for Spanish and Italian Mannerist artists to thrive in the colonies. Mannerism became the preferred style of the empire. The Maniera in Mexico, or what some scholars have referred to the prosaic style, quickly dominated major ecclesiastic commissions of the time. As noted by art historian Marcus B. Burke, in Spain, quote, the style is marked by a sober realism and a sense of classical decorum, representing a return to high Renaissance principles without the ideal quote-unquote poetry of that period's composition, end of quote. This style, which in Spain was led by Tridentine artists such as Francisco Pacheco and Vicente Carduccio, who were two artists that were highly influential in Mexico, also flourished in Mexico in retablos of central New Spain, through artists such as Simón Perens, Baltasar de Chave Orio, and Andrés de la Concha. This style depended on the elongated forms of Italian mannerism that retained the simplicity of Renaissance compositions. Mannerism in Spain and its colonies abstracted the realistic elements of Quattrocento Italian paintings to avoid doctrine confusion. And I have a quick example right here. We can see on the right the image of one of this um, of one of this retablos, which right now is it's closed because of the earthquake in 2016. There hasn't been enough funding to restore the Church of Huejolcingo. But if you notice, if you this is a picture that I took myself. So from the bottom of the retablo, you can see the figures of Christ. You can see these elongated forms. So this new instruction, the conversion of natives, necessitated of a mannerist form, but it contained the classical Renaissance triangular compositions. So it was something that was perfectly suited for, once again, the need of empire. Mannerism was adopted by generations of criollo artists. And when I speak of criollo artists, I mean white Spaniards born in the Americas. Criollo artists who, while developing unique local manifestations of Baroque painting, retained the prosaic principles that best suited the main purposes in Mexico. That is, painting as an instruction and as a tool of empire, both for the continuous conversion of Indio populations and simultaneous rejection from its emergent painting canon. The effectiveness of mannerism as a tool for spiritual conversion and its disassociation with the Renaissance conventions allowed for its formal elements to remain an integral part of official Novo Hispanic hegemonic visual culture for over two centuries. By 1668, ordinances were established specifically to exclude Indian artists, who, as noted by art historian Ilona Katsu, quote, were to be strictly banned from creating images of saints or establishing workshops without first being examined, end of quote. Work deemed quote unquote popular dominated the late 17th and 18th century unofficial painting market with depictions of aerial views of Mexico City, commercial building facades, and festivals of religious and civic nature. Another important contribution is the syncretic manifestations of religious iconography that continue to dominate the so-called religious folk art market. So here I have a couple of images from the 19th century. These are paintings known as ex votos. These are made by everyday people in Mexico, and they became very popular in the 19th century with the advent of roof constructions made out of tin. So to me, ex votos represent a testament <coughs> of the fact that for two, three hundred years, indigenized communities were prohibited to create this type of images. And as soon as independence started, this is what we get. This is from the New Mexico State University. It's part of my exhibition that is touring, contemporary ex-votos. Check it out. Anyway. 
with the advent, and now moving towards the late 18th century, with the advent of Mexico City's Royal Academy of San Carlos, and the official recognition of Criollo artists as leading cultural producers of the Viceroyalty, the remnants of mannerism quickly die away. In general, buen gusto, or good taste, saw the emerging rupture from mannerism and Baroque aesthetics to an embracing of neoclassicism in both architecture and painting. However, these activities that place, uh, these activities that place the Spanish colonies parallel with European styles were quickly interrupted by the wars of independence. After Mexico won its right for self-governance, painting reclaimed its main role to be in the service of empire. More specifically, according to art historian Rey Hernández Durán, during the presidential administration of Antonio López de Santana in the 1830s, who, quote, decreed that giving the significance of the art to any nation, the academy be renovated, end of quote. Art producing conjunction with dominant political discourse continue to place an emphasis on canonical concepts of European beauty and harmony. Mexico's search for a place in global 19th century dialogues on art, science, and politics depended wholly on rectifying its alleged bad taste or mal gusto. Later, during the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, which lasted from 1884 to 1911, an epoch known as the Porfiriato, he pushed to insert Mexico into artistic, scientific, and industrialized international arenas. A significant economic prosperity was attained through the considerable growth of its mining and textile industries and urban centers, all of which depended heavily on foreign capital in its ever-growing railroad track construction. The conventions of romanticism, more specifically romantic landscape, as, it developed, as they developed in the Academy of San Carlos in the middle of the 19th century, were later co-opted by the Porfiriato. Romantic painting became key in the articulation of nationhood, sentimentalizing individual connections to territories and resources as a way of articulating a healthy and modern country. However, inserting the newly independent nation into a global framework of artistic production meant that the character of state-sponsored art was precisely and paradoxically at the service of universalized modernity. In his seminal book, Race and Manifest Destiny, historian Reginald Horseman explains how the race of Romanticism in the US, quote, parallels in time the growth and acceptance of the new scientific racialism because it was less interest in the features uniting mankind and nations than in the features separating them. In Mexico, a similar racially driven attachment to romanticism occurred during the Porfiriato. Mexican landscape artists such as Jose Maria Velasco, Luis Cotto, and Casimiro Castro all depicted vistas in which trains slice through idyllic landscapes thereby dismantling myths of Mexico as a wild frontier and simultaneously magnifying a newly found love for the country's natural resources. So while these things are true, we also have that in images like the, um, the, Valle, the Valle de Mexico de del Cerro de San Isabel or the Valley of Mexico from San Isabel Mountain, we have all these symbols that pertain to the nation. We have, for example, the, the hill of Tepeyac, where the Virgen de Guadalupe appear. We have El Iztaccíhuatl and Popocatépetl that are always related to a love story from the Aztec period. But at the same time as you have all of that, you have, for example, technology. You see a little bit of smoke coming from the landscape. But something that ties everything to its past is always going to be its indigenized subjects. And I meant to say this earlier. But I don't use the word, at least in my scholarship, the word indigenous anymore. I talk about indigenized subject because indigenous is what happened to native peoples, what was done to native peoples of Mexico when the Spanish arrived. So by saying indigenized, I'm talking about a process which continues to this day. And I also will use the word indio because that's the word that was used in the archive 
So that creates and gives it a historical specificity to the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. So again, indigenized keeps it into a process, and Indio makes it more of a historical specificity. So again, the indigenized subjects of Mexico are what are anchoring its past. Horseman continues. The exaltation of the state as an instrument of divine purpose, although intended primarily to stimulate the growth of a German nation, fell on receptive ears in England and in the United States, and I will argue the rest of the Americas. In fact, when you look at the curriculum of, of the Academia de San Carlos, it's filled with, um, with, with, with scholars from 18th and 19th century Germany. The nation's history in painting was affixed to a romantic, and I will say a German romantic, current of landscape, one sentimentally calling on the emotions of a nascent race. This is mestizaje, which was an emerging racialized ideology espoused and championed by the government that emphasized the supremacy of Mexicans as a cohesive race. It exalted the fusion of indigenized and European legacies, augmenting the country's Indian predicament, or the highlight of a glorious Mesoamerican past while mistreating contemporary native communities. This logic permitted the Academia de San Carlos to emphasize the history of the Aztec, with particular attention to the foundation of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital where Mexico City was erected. It's a central theme in many of their saloons and annual contests, which is one of the images that we see right here to your left. And while they are promoting this type of images, simultaneously they continue to regard colonial indigenized artists as simple copyists that lack the inventio of criollo artists. And this is a topic that I'm developing thanks to Emily who commissioned this essay for one of the volumes that she is working, she is working on. To conclude, the emergence of the Mexican modern state invested in belated nationalist romanticism also gave rise to unique articulations of national art echoing past colonial administrations that embrace specific painting movements, regardless of their relevance in Europe. The convoluted processes of the racialization of Mexico's pueblos originarios, or Mexico's native peoples, before and after independence, downplayed their contributions to the canon of painting. Considering painting as a, cool of, uh, as a, cool, as a tool of empire, the configuration of their placement in the fabric of the nation as either a racialized class or vice versa kept the painters of the survey hue presented producing within these constraints. This resulted in the exclusion of native communities from any dialogue that pertained to the nation's future. So rather than speaking of novel Hispanic and Mexican painting styles emerging belatedly, we must assess the history of this medium's complacency in the erasure of indigenized contributors. Thank you so much. Hi. I want to start with a note of thanks to Emily Burns for her tireless work and brilliant innovative mind that has brought us all together here, as well as online for the past few months. With the support of David Peters Corbet and the Center for American Art here at the Courtauld, Emily has nurtured rigorous and capacious programming that stands out as particularly crucial and deeply urgent in our contemporary scholarly moment. For both the invitation to join today and for her labors in pulling these events together, I am deeply grateful to Emily, to David, to Akisha, and to the Portfolio team. Belatedness, in all its iterations, pulls us back to the idea of progress, specifically a progress that has been delayed, been set behind, or a distraction that threatens to confuse forward momentum. I know I'm not alone in associating the word most closely with birthdays. 
and with the cards that beg forgiveness for forgetfulness, humorously suggesting that one does not have their lives pulled together, and that is why the card is late. <laughs> Yet, the belated birthday card seems to underline the fundamental disassociative and out-of-time experience of birthdays and their celebration. We never feel an age, because of course, what would that even mean? Whether we are 16 or 60, Numerical age is a difference without a, without a causal effective distinction. If we do feel older, it is certainly not because it happens on any particular schedule or at annual increments. Thus, to mark a forgotten birthday is never marking a person with any specificity, but instead marking time, or rather marking the time when you remembered that you had forgotten time. Because no matter what the birthday, or whether it was remembered or forgotten, both the sender and the recipient of said card are older. They are not the same. They are changed in ways that will be fundamentally unknowable to them and others for years, if ever. The birthday is always about time, and the belated birthday greeting apology is simply the regretful rememory of the memory of time. This paper I'm giving today is pulled from a project I'm working on about the visual imagery of the American Natural History Museum in New York City. As part of my research, I interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson, director of the Rose Center for Earth and Space at the AMNH, and noted astrophysicist. deGrasse is also very much a public intellectual in what that means in today's society, and that he has a talk, he's on talk shows, he hosts a podcast, again, a crucial component of the public intellectual, and also regularly battles in support of science and scientific education online. I was particularly interested in speaking with him, as he has on numerous occasions discussed how the, or, the original Hayden Planetarium was a life transformative space for him as a black child in New York City who seldom saw the sky. Additionally, his input was crucial as one of the voices associated with the new Rose Center redesign, and more generally because astronomers have their own tempestuous relationship with the power and influence of imagery. About halfway through the interview, he looked at me and sighed and ruefully said, we've got to remember this, and here he was referencing art and science. It's just not a two-way street. Science teaches art, but art never teaches science. He appreciated, kindly, that this was perhaps disappointing, or was a disappointing thing to say to someone who, as an art historian, had you know, invested some time in this art, <laughs> and reminded me that he has, of course, as we can see here, an affection for Van Gogh, <laughs> as an evidence of his sympathies for my predicament. <laughs> Yet, he apologetically concluded, art does not help people the way you might want it to. Tyson is not the first to suggest this idea that the fissures and intellectual contributions between art and science are vast, unbridgeable, and unequal. English scientist and novelist C.P. Snow famously articulated this divide in what he termed the two cultures, a binary system of knowledge making, of knowledge making in which, bluntly put, art is invented and science is discovered. As Caroline Jones and Peter, Peter Gallison write about Snow's theory, quote, like all binaries, art and science need to be yoked together, yet held apart, in order to accrue the strengths of their polar positions soft versus hard, intuitive versus analytical, inductive versus deductive, <coughs> visual versus logical, random versus systematic, autonomous versus collective, and like all binaries at some level, female versus male. And I would like to add to this non-white versus white. Pulling back to Tyson's framing of the supposed chasm between art and science, it occurred to me in preparing for this that this was a lot like a birthday celebration a difference without an effective distinction. Art and science are not streets leading us on organized paths with directional potential, just as a birthday does not bring or suspend time. Birthdays don't age us. They indeed have nothing to do with aging our bodies. It's all about time. The binary about art and science is also not about process, but time. Which is the future and which is the past? 
And thus, belatedness in both examples reveals this fundamental misreading and disconnect that is then tinged with disappointment and regret, a sense of stopping a forward flow, of prohibiting the future, and a perpetually never, and instead demanding a perpetually never ending past. Indeed, the dialogues concerning belatedness create much of the culture and epistemological tensions between art and science in the 20th century, particularly in the United States. In seeking meaning, authenticity, and authority, natives emer na narratives emerge about what discipline and fields can promise the most future futuridity, the most drive, the most distance from belatedness. All knowledge is not equal, and belatedness becomes the language of disciplinary anxiety about cultural and intellectual authority. Turning now to the AMNH's Hayden Planetarium and its evolution into the Rose Center for Earth and Space, I want to puzzle how these spaces manifested the fear of belatedness as a competition for intellectual and visual authenticities. These projects, which promise to promote the dual potentials of art and science, instead expose rivalries for epistemological dominance and highlight the ongoing power and problems of belatedness to our intellectual landscapes. The Hayden was built in 1935, but was part of a growing field and site of interest for the AMNH. Donations of asteroids and meteoroids um, and, um, and building were building in public interest in astronomy, which instigated a new department in 1924. Thus began a concerted effort to build a space that could communicate ideas about the stars, outer space, and shifting theories of physics and sight. The visual was, even in its earliest imaginings, crucial to this burgeoning department at the AMNH. Although this slide is far from ideal, um, uh, this is um, the earliest installation of, a meteor of meteoroids, which was positioned in a place of honor in the new 77th Street entrance and was evidence of the first attempt to stake space for what they hoped to be a future hall. We see here on the floor a mosaic inlaid of a sun with then various zodiac signs radiating around it. While easily, easily dismissible as merely decoration, what is evidenced here would be the act of a kind of loose, inclusive vision of the sky with earth, science, myth, and art. This ideology was further evidenced by the team assembled in 1925 with the mission to create a new hall. Artists joining scientists as collaborators in the quest to visualize what they could see in telescopes and know from data. The most famous of these artist scientists in this early phase was Howard Russell Butler. Butler's paintings of surfaces of the moon, as you can see in the back here, and Mars were created with incredible dedication to their available contemporary scientific data. Showing you this um, uh, above a uh, doorway in the future Hayden Planetarium, and then this is the color version of it. Specifically, Butler was, fund was, fund um, was fundamentally interested in, in scientific and public and perceptions and understandings of ellipses, of eclipses rather. Um, the required detailed formulas for noting in the very short sketch time that eclipses offered notes about color saturation percent of orbital coverage per time frame, and then an ability not to lose details in a boring or visually stilted image. In short, even in these early exploratory moments, there was an understanding of the necessary cooperation of scientific data and visual representations. And as I noted, these three eclipse paintings would ultimately hang in the, in the Hayden Planetarium about a decade later. While there were small steps to build an astronomy program at the AMNH, there was no funding. This shifted, however, in the early 1930s when um, President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal programming approved loans to build a planetarium. It is not an exaggeration, although it seems quite frankly absurd, I'm sure, to us today, to me today, um, to say that officials in New York, um, uh, uh, all kinds, including um, uh, Robert Moses, um, who was uh, central to this, that the planetarium was hoped to be for New York City as transformational and future-making as other um, New Deal projects, such as the Tennessee Valley Authority, with its massive dam structure. It was with its borrowed money, political aspirations, and loaded fears of an ongoing US depression that the impossibly overhyped and politically overburdened Hayden Planetarium opened in 1935. 
Get us with early stages of the thinking on the visual and the tone of the early astronomy hall. The Hayden Planetarium offered the public a myriad of visions of space and science. Notably, this vision of a dialogue about space was somewhat global and indeed capacious in regard to time. While many of the exhibits focused on a rather state glorification of European astronomers from Galileo forward, there were also significant investments in alternative ideas and knowledges about time and space. And I'm just going to show you quickly here. Again, um, you can see them. This is another terrible slide. I promise better slides are coming. Um, uh, along the top, you can see images of mythological um, uh, zodiacs. Here we have embedded in the floor um, an Aztec calendar. Um, and I will talk now about the night image. Indeed, most problematic, but also most provocative, was Charles Knight's mural depicting, and I use that word broadly, um, Blackfoot tribal images about the sun and moon gods and the creation of the universe. Knight was already famous and in demand for his dinosaur images, which by the 1930s decorated halls of, the most, of most of the major U.S. natural history museums. And thus commissioning this mural, mural project was a major investment in terms of time and money for the new planetarium. Suffice it to say, the mural is deeply flawed in all ways, from its understanding and then incorrect depiction of Blackfoot traditions, to the related AM and H history of colonizing, appropriating, destroying, and disparaging indigenous lives, history, memory, imagery, and people. This mural is, to put it frankly, a hot mess, and was even in its own moment, as it was being, as when it was revealed, it was, it would unveil, it was immediately disparaged by the AM and H anthropological department. Hardly a, a, a group themselves are arbiters of moral or intellectual high ground. Yet what we can see in the subsequent photo of the mural in the background of the small exhibitions, the curator of the Hayden were willing to represent diverse knowledges, however incorrect. While everything else about the museum, even this educational station, demands adherence to narrow constructs of science as always already an Enlightenment Western white male definitive knowledge source. The Hayden from the beginning complicated this messaging with the pernicious reminder that lots of people have thought about and created knowledge about the stars and the origins of the universe. Indeed, so much of the Hayden's outreach was, outreach was very much oriented towards pulling in this multi-directional visual dialogue about space. And this is they had actually annual, um, uh, um, uh, annual competitions to create visual imagery about the, about the Hayden and uh, outer space. Yet, or indeed because of the religious aspirations for the new space, by the early 1940s, there was already significant grumbling about the Hayden. In addition to struggling to meet loan payments, attendance had dipped significantly in the decade after, this, after the space opened, with one director noting dejectively that people were staying away in droves. The kick the Hayden needed was delivered with the space race, a new imagery that was installed in the late in the late nineteen in the mid nineteen fifties that leaned towards the fantastical and the dramatic. Curators highlighted new technologies of installation with blacklit paintings and new projections and planetary planetary shows, willing to display images that were more culturally and symbolic than strictly scientific. They continue to play visually with the potential liminal positions of science, space, and time. This broad scope of visual narratives allowed for varied planetary imagination. It would seem obvious to suggest that they simply had to be nimble um, until space flight, um, because there were simply no photographs, so that this kind of visual cacophony was all curators could do to populate the spaces. Yet interestingly, even after the 1960s and 70s, photography doesn't really change this visual tone. The Hayden simply added photographs to the mix, allowing them to sit next to mythological images and murals painted from the 1930s and 40s. Indeed, in the 1970s, the Hayden began in earnest collecting <coughs> exhibitions of contemporary artists reacting to space and outer space imagery. These exhibitions were notably, also notably featured numerous women and non-white artists. As an institution that historically had used those bodies only as exhibition materials, this was a significant deviation. Now, I don't want to in any way suggest that the Hayden Planetarium was some kind of museum nirvana of love and knowledge making tolerance. But what is interesting and notable here for our dialogues about belatedness 
Is the outside pressure consistently put on the Hayden to be ahead of its time, to use science as a way to create a future, to provide, to prove space as a fissure from the past, to definitively defy belatedness? Yet time after time, the Hayden curators let science and art play to audiences, and specifically with a slipperiness of time. If the 1950s and 60s offered some kind of reprieve for the Hayden Planetarium, by the 1970s and 80s, new criticism of the space and complaints began again. The Hayden unabashedly leaned into the popularity of Star Wars and Star Trek and continued their, and expanded indeed, their contemporary exhibition, um, uh, uh, exhibitions with a major new art commission in 1987, as we see here, um, uh, by Michelle Ocadonar. Um, yeah, the shuttering of the Apollo program matched with renewed calls that the planetarium was too much of an entertainment and not enough science, again, a variation on our two cultures theme, forced kind of a crisis. The argument for a substantial change to the Hayden was taken up with vigor in 1993 by the new president of the AMNH, Alan, Ellen Futter. In a profile about Futter for the New Yorker in 1995, her hopes for the new planetarium were described as a nostalgia, were described by the author um, as taking, quote, a nostalgic piece from the Flash Gordon era and transforming it into a high-tech astronomy exhibit. She noted that she wanted a very different space and indeed ultimately a very different museum than the one she walked into. She saw reimagining the Hayden as not, as, just, as not just a major building project, but one that would create what she called a new intellectual framework for all exhibitions. Indeed, the AMNH was most certainly in need of a new vision and new thinking broadly, and it is hard not to see the bombastic architectural space and crowing around it as an attempt to distance the museum at the dawn of a new century from their long and problematic history with science, race, collecting, and exhibition, and expedition histories. The 1990s and early 2000s had been a series of public relations nightmares for the museum, featuring numerous legal and public protests from indigenous populations regarding materials stolen from them and representation of their tribal cultures and traditions within the museum. In other words, in the late 1990s, the museum needed a win. And perhaps the hope was that in outer space, no one could hear you scream if you were a protester or a critic. The result was a $210 million renovation, resulting in the Rose Center for Earth and Space, which opened to great fanfare in 2000. A flashy exterior facing space features a glass enclosure that encases the frame of the older Hague Planetarium. This new building also inaugurated the new Department of Astrophysics, which would replace the less futuristic sounding Department of Astronomy. Hayden's particular visual version of outer space came to an abrupt halt with the opening of the Rose Center in 2000. This renovation resulted in an almost total removal of all imagery that was not photographic or video based. Everything that looked like art that was not digitally produced was removed from view. And this was, as you can imagine, no small task that required murals being ripped out of walls, mosaics and inlaid designs jackhammered out of the floor, and even newly created works such as Donner's massive work were removed and actually literally placed on the opposite side of the museum. In place of these works, as Tyson promised in his 1999 memo to the museum community about the closing of the Hayden, the Rose Center was to be the marking of a new era with a space he claimed that would be equipped to provide unprecedented educational and scientific opportunities for the public to become engaged with the splendor of our universe. Equipped was a prescient term, for equipment was meant to be strictly digital, with all of the other versions um, of the visual eliminated. And the plan for the museum space digital screens would display daily updates on new scientific discoveries, live feeds from NASA, and museum content. As we sit here in 2023, it will surprise absolutely no one that this tech, even today, works only sporadically. And the need to produce new internal content was immediately unsustainable. Indeed, all the NASA imagery is always better accessed on your phone. The visual desire was for the look of a new space to be ever ahead, ever progressive, never looking back. Yet given the very nature of technology, the visual result is always late, always behind. Art and the visual redeemed the impediment to the future. 
Yet ironically, the solution put the, pushed the museum even farther back. This was essentially a, visu, a visual kind of clean sweep of the ropes and a very narrow vision of space that encompasses it, that, that a very narrow vision of what space encompasses. And more importantly, who and how can speak to and see space. The antiseptic um, uh, data-driven space was meant to decidedly announce a new era, a very new planetary and temporal imagination. Exploration, it would seem, was reframed as neutral, finally rid of its problematic colonial human histories, and instead knowledge, science, and space was to be severed from the human hand, from the past, and indeed from the messy history of the AM and H. It is thus with no small dose of irony that the new Rose Center reflects the popular and very much human-based space visions of Kubrick and others. And while there is no explicit no art allowed rule in the space, the visual dryness and disappearance of so much visual work was noted by those who had early tours of the new building in 1999. When the architecture was meant to shock and awe, and the digital was meant to refocus the authority of data and scientific study, complaints were immediately lodged that there needed to be something on the walls. A solution was found in using Michael Light's reprinting and reinterpretation of the Apollo mission photographs, using NASA's then largely ignored archive of thousands of images taken by astronauts on the various Apollo missions. The artist reprinted all the missions as one cohesive view, specifically his reimagined trip of himself going on a trip to the moon. The light has, light has suggested that this installation um, uh, uh, is miserable, to, um, in his opinion, and resulted in what he calls essentially glorious wallpaper. Indeed, wedged into elevator and waiting spaces and the gift shop, the show is the only representation of what we can call art in these spaces, and um, so was simultaneously dismissed. Sorry. Dropped an image of the, uh, the, 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 the light images. Apologies about that. They're basically, you would recognize them. They're images of the moon um, uh, taken from outer space. In regard of the seeming failures of this visual strategy, the Rose has remained devoted to their initial 2000 ideology and the, um, about the need to only show the public visual data that is digitally produced. Yet as art historian Elizabeth Kessler reminds us about the Hubble imagery and all other computer-generated images, such as the very newly adored image of black holes and indeed even the daily updates from NASA, astronomers have um, developed representational conventions and an aesthetic style, vividly colored, exquisitely detailed, and brilliantly lit. Our data is always messed with, made familiar, made basically into art. Art and science are a difference without an effective distinction. The Rose imagines that machines and technologies will show the truth, yet this masks the new reality that demands more, not less, of the visual. This also cuts audiences off from a crucial dialogue about the meaning of the visual and changing knowledge cultures, namely ideas such as indigenous time and origin stories, black futurities, and queer time and space, which pulls us back to the crisis of the belated. Space is always tied to time, and time and knowledge making are, at least in the fantasy of the two cultures and this fictive and destruction, destructive divide between art and science, easily weaponized. Like a belated birthday greeting, which becomes so often a space for self-hatred, failure, and apology, picturing space can be turned into a self-defeating, restrictive paradigm. Yet perhaps in embracing belatedness more broadly could provide a generative potential to highlight a version of the not here, the not there, the not now, the not then, the almost there, a version that is both yours and mine, and that is available to us, to the stars and beyond. Thank you. Emmanuel, for these talks. Um, we have some time for questions and discussion, so I'll invite Emmanuel to come back um, to the front of the room. Um, we do have a kind of handheld microphone that I can walk around and um, pass out as people have questions. Um, and maybe I'll start with one question as we are uh, to give you a moment to gather your thoughts about um, the rich dialogues, thank you, between um, these two papers. Sorry. 
One question that I was thinking about as you were discussing um, your case studies is about the role of institutions, uh, but whether governmental or museums, uh, in trying to build a sense of consensus. And do you think, I'm curious if you think that the kind of construct of belatedness and the kind of anxieties around it are tied to this idea of uh, consensus building. Is that where, uh, one of the sources of belatedness? And then is it then individuals and um, kind of objects, either working wittingly or not, uh, that is where we can find kind of interruptions to this construct? It's, it's complicated in Mexico because I don't think the producers of this work, either in the colonial period or in the 19th century, necessarily consider themselves as being late to the game. Um, there is a, there's a term by uh, a Mexican art historian, late Mexican art historian Juana Gutierrez Aces, that speaks about the idea of leveling your practice to the place where you arrive. So for example, when you have um, a Spanish artist arriving to Mexico, they might be in vogue with everything that is happening over there. So they have to level their practice to fit the market. Nivelación. So in the, in, the, in the colonial period, it's about institutional acceptance from the royalty that was important to, to, to this group of artists. In the 19th century is an entire nation trying to fit within these cultural <laughs> conversations around, um, around the world. So I don't think there was a full awareness of that <coughs> until post-revolution when there is a social, political, and cultural consensus that we should create something that is unique to us. And that's when Diego Rivera comes back from Europe and creates his own style, and then muralism explodes. And even though that's also government-led, which not a lot of people like really get into, um, it, it really, it, with, the, with the visual cultures that I analyzed, 17, 18, and 19th century, the, it's hard to talk about a consensus because somebody like, like Audio, like Ivia, like all of these artists, they just want to be respected as artists. And in the 19th century, they just want Mexico to be respected as, as, a, as a country. Um, I guess I hope that, <laughs> that answers. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that... Um, I, I think that in the case of the AMNH, but I think that this is true of all museums. I mean, there's an enormous amount. I mean, there's a paucity of resources, and the AMNH is very much a siloed institution. So, like every department is literally fighting every other department for funding. But then, very early on, too, the the sort of the the scientific wing breaks off from the exhibition wing. So there's like multiple missions that are often really competing within this institutional space. But authority is what everyone is fighting for. Um, and authority in this context of this museum, um, as I think it is in, in many museums, is based around ideas of um, are you ahead? Do you, are you forward thinking? Um, are you looking to depict the future of the field? So even though, I mean, this is true even in sort of like dinosaur world, that, um, you know, there's an incredible amount of anxiety about how you present dinosaurs and how is it the most current thinking about dinosaurs and what if that current thinking turns out to be wrong? Does that somehow undermine the process of science? Um, I mean, we saw this out play out most recently was sort of pan the pandemic was a sort of like, wait, I thought you told us we didn't need masks and now we do need masks. This sort of very much this idea that if, if you ever have to go back or change methods, um, there's been some kind of fundamental fissure of authority that happens. And so I think 
um, what I see, and, and sort of even why it was, it, I've been, I've really tried to talk to the individuals like Degrassi Tyson. I mean, they have a lot on the line, and they are very much, you know, that the, it, it, there's a lot of funding and programming that goes along with this. So I do think it is actually quite individual, um, and that it, it it does sort of mean that this idea of like I don't want to I don't want to be late to the party, so to speak. I don't want to be behind. Questions. I see lots of hands. Okay, I will work my way uh, from the front to the back here. I think we can share this if we want. Can you all hear the mic? It doesn't sound like it is. Now we have it? Yeah. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you both for your wonderful paper. Uh, but I have a question for Emmanuel. Thank you. Um, maybe it's a, a longer question. Um, from the agency of indigenous people, which is called indigenizing. Mm -hmm. And with the notion of copy and copying mm -hmm. versus original, mm -hmm. can we really think, as you so also shown a few images from the 16th century, mm -hmm. that the natives, so to, to use that term for the moment, were only copying Renaissance images told by the missionaries and other people? Mm -hmm. Because we also who shouldn't forget that Europe was heterogeneous at that moment, and uh, still the visual code, so to speak, at that moment is between medieval and Renaissance. And what comes to the so-called new world is also, quote, unquote, in between those things. And um, so the agency of the indigenous, the origi uh, originality, and the representation of the indigenous in the 19th century mm -hmm. or, or earlier. So that would be my question. And, and then you show the, the image of Pedro de Dante. Yeah, it, it's, and, it's uh, not an image of him, it's just an it's example. Of the uh, Capilla de San Jose. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting that it's the, the construction of the first chapel for the natives mm -hmm. was uh, the, the same protector was uh, San Jose, St. Joseph which was being uh, renewed both in Europe, especially Spain, and the uh, Hispanic territories or new conquered territories because that thing became young yeah. in Mexico. So become... because I'm working on the 18th century feather painting on St. Joseph, so I wouldn't say for that that it's a copy because there is no original of a St. Joseph like that. And Thank you so much. Yes, the, the, the problem with the term copying, it's a historiographical one. Mm -hmm. So from, from the first chronicles of conquest that were produced, not the very first ones, but the ones produced later in the 16th century, they always referred to these indigenized artists as being masters of, of, of the copy. And they are reduced to being copied. Up until 1555, when you have the first ordinances that prohibit their inclusion into major ecclesiastical commissions, they are respected as these magnificent copiadores. Um, one of the most prominent artists prior to this period is the creator of the image of the Virgen de Guadalupe. So there's a level of respect, but their mastery becomes such that then they have to exclude them from everything. And every mention of the of the artists of that period, the indigenized artists of that period, it's always through the lens of the copy. That immediately separates them from the inventio that the criollos um, developed for themselves. In fact, artists like Miguel Pando and Correa signed inventor in their canvases for that same reason. And then when you get to the 19th century, any mention of those artists it's simply the practice of what's to come after the Europeans arrive. So the few mentions of some of the 
The first, the first important art history book created in the 19th century by Jose Bernardo Couto, Diálogo sobre la pintura, the only reference to those artists uh, are a couple of lines that reference them as being good copiadores, buenos copiadores, yeah. or copiadores de lo natural. So the way that I, that I am developing this discussion for this article is, is the way that historiography has treated them and the way that they were allowed to change or adapt um, the, the, the original the original images. It's a long, it's a long no, um, I was subject. thinking more of Alessandra Russo's like notion of working with two originals mm -hmm. and creating the third novel thing mm -hmm. out of two. So that was thank yeah. you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you both for your really rich talks. Um, I had a, a question for Emmanuel that's um, hopefully not too repetitive because I think we're thinking in the same, in the same vein about agency and indigenous and indigenized. And I was really interested um, in your kind of use of indigenized to remind us, of course, of the colonial construction of the category of indigenous. Um, but I was also kind of holding it beside the current function of indigenizing in a North American discourse of Native studies where to, it, the, the ongoing process of indigenizing is about filling back up colonial spaces and autonomous indigenous spaces with indigenous knowledges um, and, and political projects, right? So we indigenize, but then this, to change the tense, indigenizing is this kind of other project on indigenous terms. Um, so we never get out of the categorical problems. <laughs> um, and so I also was sort of wondering about whether um, that the sort of historical depth of that project of indigenizing um, within the histories that you're telling and how legible it is at the kind of macro scale of the historiographies you are moving through today, or whether we need kind of micro histories to really get at the texture of how um, uh, indigenized artists are um, are uh, uh, intervening and bending these colonial uh, norms to their own yeah. projects. Um, and then I don't know if I should continue because I had a question for Alexis as well. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Pause first. Go ahead. Yeah. So I can only speak to the, the colonial period and what I study, because we often speak in relation to castas, um, even though the casta system really doesn't come into f full fruition later in the um, late 17th, 18th century. But we tend to take the archive as authority when it comes to the colonial period. But the way that power relations function in Mexico, you see something in the archive, and then in real life was completely different. The, the, the ways in which we have racialized the idea of indigeneity in Mexico, it's long and oppressive from 1521 to this day. The way that, um, the way that Pueblos Originarios identify themselves today, it's, it's a different type of politics than the ones that I'm discussing. So when I said I use the term indigenize to keep it in terms of process and separating it from the fiction that is the archive it's for the specificity of the history of those 300 years even with the 19th century i have to be very careful because already there's different notions of what indigenous or pueblos originarios are just with this new precedent there's a, re a, a renewed interest oh he had actual representative of pueblos originarios in his inaugural um, in his inaugural um, celebrations, which has never happened before. So that's yet another level of um, indigenization of Mexico that has never occurred before. So again, when it comes to indigenized, I'm really specific counteracting the, the silences that the archive represents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm not thinking, but Alexis, um, I really, uh, appreciated the way in which you saw, I guess, potential in the um, cacophony <laughs> of art and science in the 1930s, even though the particular way in which it 
manifested was rife with the colonial hierarchies and temporalities of, of that of that moment. And I wonder, since you ended again with that note of sort of possibility, um, what the I guess the cacophony inside the um, the Natural History Museum or the ANH in particular. Uh, might look like today, is there a, a particular direction that, um, that things are headed or could be headed where you see belatedness doing something other than separating people into hierarchies, right? But creating a kind of um, cacophony that we, we would want to uh, uh, embrace or experience in a space like this. Um, I, there's a new president um, uh, of the AMNH, um, and so um, there's always, um, I, I would love to imagine optimistically that a new president means new, and it can mean, like changes. Um, although historically, um, for museums in the United States, um, you know, Museum directors are there to build, um, to work trustees, to move on to the next bigger institution that they want to be. I mean, that, that that's its own sort of route. But that's jaded, and it's early in the conference. I don't really want to bring us all <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think that actually, I, I tend to see a bit more optimism in a place like the Field Museum, and some of the ways in which they have um, decided to confront their history um, and the history of natural history museums. Um, I think here in England, I think that um, the Welcome Collection um, has, is also trying to do something. Um, again, I think these are all like real mixed, it's a real mixed bag. Um, I think the way that unfortunately the American Natural History Museum has historically dealt with things that embarrass them or things that are um, uh, old or knowledge that they no longer want to uh, hold is to is to get rid of them. There was like massive burning of um, paintings um, of um, Native American imagery in the 1960s and 70s because they tried to sell them at flea flea markets and they couldn't sell them, so they just burned them. Um, you know, again, even with the Rose Planetarium, a lot of the the murals were simply sort of taken photographs of and then destroyed um, or pasted over and then walls put in them so that I mean I guess at some point in the future they can be looked at again but not really not realistically um, so I think I, I think that what I would like to see is a little more confrontation by the museum of what of sort of what their belated mission is um, uh, and, and and what do you do with a, a a very good friend who sort of talks about the, the, the perhaps the need to hospice natural history museums <laughs> um, uh, to put them in a loving place where we can say goodbye. Um, I, I have conflicting feelings about that, but I do think that there does need to be a way in which um, uh, there can be more potential for more voices. Um, and more understandings of the different ways in which time and space have been understood historically. Um, uh, and um, I do think that this iteration of the Rose is particularly perniciously damaging. Thank you both for those excellent papers. Um, I noticed an overlap in them that really intrigued me, and I'd like to get your thoughts, each of your thoughts on it. And that is the inclusion of an Aztec calendar stone. Um, Manuel, in your paper, um, where Diaz is proudly standing next to it, I think at the National Museum of Anthropology, if I'm not mistaken, but I think that's where he is. Um, and then, um, Alexis, I was also interested that that imagery was included at the Hayden when it opened. And then I guess related to that, I'm curious if it still survives or if it was eliminated um, when so many things were excised um, with the opening of the rose. But I'd love to hear each of you from your respective frameworks talk about why the Aztec calendar stone should have been connected with this notion of futurity, when it also, of course, is referencing a historic past. So thank you. Or Diaz, he inaugurates a practice of almost like every president taking their portrait in front of the so-called Aztec um, calendar. 
he, he, he promotes the history of the Aztecs. The seat of, M, of the Aztec Empire is Mexico City. So Mexico City becomes the seat of Mexico as a nation and making those connections between an empire to an aspiring new empire were very important. So symbols of the nation related to, to the Aztecs began really in the 19th century. The Academia de San Carlos does a lot of this work. Of course, it's much more complicated. It's about liberals versus conservatives. Conservatives believe that the, the history of Mexico started with the Spanish, the liberals believe that it was with the Aztecs and, and the Mayans. That is solidified through the mural program, through the, mural, through, the, through the modernist in Mexico, and internationally through the Chicano movement and their mural programs throughout the United States. So there's like a long history of um, using the iconography of the Aztec empire to amplify ideas of indigeneity, mestizaje, et cetera, et cetera. But really, Diaz brings it into the foreground nationally, but also internationally with, uh, with the, um, the pavilion, for example, of Mexico in Paris, um, and the representation of Mexico in Chicago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a long, long history. I always put that in contrast with a Mexican comedian, Cantinflas, from the 1940s, who's holding the Aztec calendar <laughs> like Atlantis. I love it. The calendar is actually one of, um, I actually don't know where it is right now. This is part of sort of the, um, the fun of doing uh, research at the AMNH is that things move between departments and some departments are very um, open with their records and some departments are not and there is no, and then what actually ends up at the archives um, is often stuff that's captured before it can be thrown out. So there's, um, let's just say, uh, an organic process of uh, history keeping over at the a &H. Mm -hmm. It's not unlike many museums and spaces like that. Um, and again, I think because there's so much of a focus on um, scientific research, on new discovery, on um, this idea of sort of knowledge making that is future looking, I think that um, if there's no easy place for it to go back into some kind of exhibition, I think things are sort of put away or in hallways in ways that can mean that it's difficult to track them down. What I will say is that there's actually an enormous amount um, of calendars and sky maps and um, all kinds of, from across the world, um, beautiful Chinese calendars, um, uh, uh, just a, 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 an amazing collection of time and space keeping objects um, that uh, are again not displayed and not seen, um, although they were actually in the 1930s and 40s more regularly. Um, uh, and so again, this sort of interesting idea, really a, an interesting contemporary narrowing of um, uh, what version of time and space we are allowed to see. Thank you. I think we need to move on to our break, but um, thank you. And um, thank you for those questions. Thank you for these papers that show so beautifully how ideas of the belated are yoked to, time, uh, to space and also to space. Um, and I look forward to talking more. Please, everyone, join us for some more informal discussion with our speakers and further questions. Um, the reception or coffee break will be just a few doors down if you turn right out the door. And we will start again with two uh, talks at 3.15. So we have about 25 minutes for a break. Thank you all. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Have a cookie. Uh, and a reminder that this next session of two talks and then discussion will be followed by a reception to which everyone is invited to, again, continue the conversation. So thank you again all for being here, and thanks to our two speakers for this session, um, who I will introduce in turn, and as with the previous session, we'll save the discussion for after both talks. Um, and thank you all for your rich questions in the previous session. Please keep generating as we um, move into uh, the next session. Our first speaker will be Jessica L. Horton,
who is an associate professor of modern and contemporary Native North American art at the University of Delaware. Um, among many articles, um, she has also published a book, Art for an Undivided Earth, the American Indian Movement Generation, um, focused um, in her scholarship both on historical and um, contemporary Native American art or ancestral and living practices. Um, and I had long been in lucky dialogue with Jessica about questions of um, settler and Native dialogues um, in the late 19th century. Um, and in her introduction to the Art for an Undivided Earth, Horton describes that project as, quote, repositioning displaced indigenous peoples, art, and knowledge at the center of an unfinished story of modernity that rightly concerns the entirety of our shared world. And I think this is a really powerful message that has also shaped the questions that I am bringing to the concept of belatedness. Um, Jessica's emphasis on multiple modernisms and I'm um, quoting again from her, pluralities of space and time undergird this project's investments in tracing multiple temporalities and thinking through how the logics of belatedness shape and also could be unraveled within systems of power. Our second speaker will be Leon Wainwright, who is professor of art history at the Open University. And I was lucky to overlap uh, with Leon um, when I lived in Oxford a few years ago. His book, Timed Out, Art and the Transnational Caribbean, also explores the tensions between modern and contemporary art in the context of proximity and diaspora, in what he describes as the, quote, politics of temporality, the ideas about time that have helped provide the very conditions of artists' struggles and the fields of possibilities for overcoming those conditions. He is also one of the few other art historians I'm aware of who have explicitly written about belatedness. If you know of others, please tell me. Um, and who have shown that to quote the out of date and behind the times can also be a productive artistic position. And I'm grateful he's able to join us today as well. So with that, I'll turn things over to Jessica Horton. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Emily, for that kind introduction. And David, I'm so pleased to have finally made it to London uh, while you're still director after some pandemic uh, canceled and delayed things. Um, thank you to everyone who helped to organize this event. Um, I am embodying jet lag <laughs> like so many of us uh, today, but I can't uh, think of a place I'd rather land. A teepee stood at the center of Expo 70 in Osaka, Japan, the first ever Asian world fair and the largest exposition in history. The canvas cover hosted crows and buffalo, constellations, fallen stars, and jagged mountain peaks. These are the more than human beings and the contours of the Blackfoot Confederacy's homeland, a vast swath of plains and ridges spanning the United States and Canada. And this lodge in particular hailed from the Blackfeet Nation, uh, which is located today in Montana and includes parts of Glacier National Park. The six meter tall lodge towered over displays of pomo baskets, Pueblo pottery, and Navajo textiles in the folk art section of the United States Pavilion. The fair was charged with simulating the city of the future as a techno-utopic solution to warnings of global environmental collapse. And the United States government's claim to the overarching theme of progress and harmony for mankind included a restaging of the Apollo 11 moon landing inside a supersized elliptical dome. Based on a NASA design, the megastructure was designed to withstand, I quote, all natural forces, unquote. And so it proposed a universal solution to earthly degradation and climatic extremity. It too was a spaceship an architecture designed to advance the cosmic frontiers of capitalism and space race, and a single hegemonic future for a select mankind. In contrast, the lodge commissioned from Blackfeet Nation artist Daryl Blackman was assigned a familiar place as a marker of the nation's proud past, a fantastical prehistory in which ecological Indians lived in harmony with nature. Common inclusions in Cold World fairs, just like the colonial expositions before them, icons of Plains cultures, the headdress and the teepee, 
were installed as ghostly witnesses to modernity. Asked to passively mourn the loss of pre-colonial purity on the sidelines of an adjacent avant-garde. Planking the teepee here, um, uh, you'll see a parade of Lakota headdresses that line the ceiling of Bus Buckminster Fuller's famous geodesic dome for Expo 67 in Montreal. Belatedness, especially when we're talking about indigenous peoples, is a function of what Mark Rifkin calls settler time. And Native arts were not just framed by this colonial order. They were the linchpin of its presumptive normativity, its seeming inevitability. And because of this, they were also positioned, Native arts, as agents of instability, of temporal incommensurability, of indigenous futures that insistently present themselves at the heart of colonial claims. Blackman's Lodge, I will argue, modeled Blackfeet futurism, in which ancient gifts from more than human beings are mobilized to expand a circle of reciprocity. The young artists, only 28 at the time of the commission, reconstituted the customary arts of his people with some innovations, alterations that guaranteed not only the adaptability of the TV in the midst of its deracination, but also its urgent relevance to a broken system of international relations, a system inherited from colonial Europe that has systematically excluded and exploited a vast majority of humans and non-humans throughout modernity. The Lodge was an agent of what I call Earth diplomacy. And this is theorized in my forthcoming book of that title, Earth diplomacy names sensuous material exchanges that invite political alliances inclusive of the land. The phrase highlights the transformative potential of indigenous cosmologies and arts, or sorry, cosmologies, whenever they are activated by native arts in geopolitical arenas worldwide. And likewise, my talk today will attempt to illuminate arts capacity to revitalize indigenous cultures of reciprocity in unlikely places toward cultivating a radically different future for international relations. The iconic white teepee circulated as an emblem of environmental sustainability and countercultural cool alongside domes in the 60s and the 70s. For example, as you see on the right, an undecorated canvas tent stood beside the patchwork zones of Drop City in Colorado in 66 and accompanied American Indian movement occupations of Alcatraz Island and the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the early 70s. You can see the lodge at the center of the photo. Plain canvas teepees became malleable symbols bent to various political agendas, indigenous and otherwise. But while I quote, a white teepee is just a teepee. A painted teepee is a tabernacle. This is what Blackman's friend and collaborator Howard Rides at the Door told me. And it is to the sensuous power of Blackfeet Lodge designs that I will now turn to develop my argument. The vivid designs painted on teepees map a tripart universe traversed by other than human guardians. Songs and stories associated with this crow lodge tell of a human hunter who gave his buffalo meat to hungry crows. Powerful crow beings appeared, and they rewarded the hunter with gifts that included the lodge design, instructions for its stewardship and replication, and the rights to lead his people. As Native Studies scholars Joseph Gladstone and Donald Pepion have argued, Blackman's ancestors used painted teepees to underwrite ethical Blackfeet governance. Individuals advanced to leadership based on uh, qualities of generosity, prowess, and vision. The mobile bands of the Blackfoot Confederacy would gather annually on the plains for ceremony, and at the center of the vast teepee camp stood the painted lodges, evidence of the spiritual endowments and political legitimacy of their caretakers. Within the circle, councils worked to achieve consensus on decisions impacting the cohabitation of the prairies. Brian Noble has termed these alliances treaty ecologies, underscoring the central role that plant and animal nations played in Blackfeet diplomacy. 
the avian Crees on the Crow Lodge did not merely symbolize power external to the surface it decorates. Her paintings manifest, make real and present, the strength and protection bestowed on wormy humans by crow beings. And individuals were in turn expected to transfer their rights to both leadership and TP designs to another in a timely fashion, thereby recirculating power through a merit-based gift economy. At the time of Osaka 70, the US government had long worked to sever tribal leadership from the customary values embedded in lodge praxis. Boarding schools, relocation programs, and rampant alcoholism had disrupted the transmission of artistic knowledges. And Blackman was just one of a small group of young people um, at Blackfeet Nation who continued to learn ceremony, song, and material culture. According to his friend Doris Kicking Woman, he was instrumental in continuing these traditions in a time of crisis. And he regularly partnered with the federally funded Museum of the Plains Indian in Browning, Montana, uh, to create restorations and replicas of Blackfeet cultural items, which you can see him uh, working on here in the museum. He was trained in women's arts by his grandmother, Sippy. She taught him how to use a treadle to efficiently sew canvas covers. And he learned ceremony from his great uncle-in-law, Fish Wolf Rowe, who transferred the Crow Lodge rights to Blackman. Roger Butterfly remembers his older half-brother as an intercultural translator. Butterfly would help him paint covers after Blackman returned from undergraduate studies at the University of Montana. And when Butterfly marveled at how quickly and accurately his relative could cut the canvas, Blackman joked, you just have to know algebra and geometry. And you can imagine how his female ancestors also knew algebra and geometry in order to precisely cut and form um, the, the, the geometric precision required uh, uh, for a, a livable TV. Dor recalls helping his friend create an estimated 50 replicas of various lodges for the Smithsonian and other institutions in the late 60s. Unfortunately, their names did not remain attached to these items. At one point, the duo switched from earth-based pigments to commercial paints, and this allowed them to decorate as many as two covers per day. To complete the commissions, Blackman stretched the protocols governing design replication, a practice that remains controversial within his community. One uh, commentator lamented from the time, I quote, confusion and duplication, especially with the lack of knowledgeable elders on this subject. Sometimes there are several examples of a well-known design, but no one being certain who actually owns the rights, unquote. But all evidence from my conversations with community and friends suggests that Blackman's choices were winning and guided by something more than cultural disorientation. Dorr notes that he and Blackman consulted with elders to ensure design accuracy, smudged and prayed over the finished lodges, and folded the covers in a customary manner before taking them to the post office. Here, Sippy, Butterfly, and other relatives and friends assist the artist uh, in the image on the right in decorating a yellow horse teepee cover on the lawn of the museum in 69. They use commercial brushes and paints that are poured from cans visible along the back wall in the left photograph of Blackman. Uh, their collaborative approach and their embrace of new materials continue a long-standing tradition of architectural experimentation on the plains. And these details suggest that Blackman cared for the transmission of TP praxis within the Blackfeet Nation, even as he innovated new forms for external agents. Blackman's friends and relatives um, unanimously lamented the loss of cultural knowledge when he died prematurely of alcoholism in 71, just one year after the Osaka Commission. For Expo 70, Blackman replicated the design for which he was the appointed caretaker. He exercised his right to gift, exceeding the capitalist terms of a paid commission. For one, he chose to gift his personal set of eight teepee poles. Poles are harvested seasonally from pines in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and a well-seasoned set is a treasured possession, a gift from the earth. Second, Blackman made calculated aesthetic decisions. 
representations of curved teepees across the 20th century show um, variability in the designs. I'm showing just two examples from around mid-century mid up to uh, Bachman's time. And they may feature a thin or extremely thick red line at middle, a narrow serrated black band with a single line of orbs at the base, or they may omit the black foundation altogether. The Osaka Lodge represents a replete compendium. Note the thick, bright red band and two rows of fallen stars, filling the unusually high, jagged black peaks at the base. These extremes still conform to a customary repertoire, suggesting, but suggest the artist's will to embolden and beautify the alliance. Blackman's Folsom paintings guarantee that the lodge would have a commanding visual and material presence, despite its reduced scale. What do I mean? Well, in 1969, US officials sent detailed instructions to black men. I quote, the diameter of the teepee base is to be 13 feet, the height including teepee poles not to exceed 19, end quote. The measurements were predetermined by the size of the platform in the folk art space in Osaka. Officials requested a replica based on black men's personal lodge and scaled to two thirds the size. Um, that lodge is seen here in the only photograph I've found at the annual North American Indian Day celebration uh, in Browning one year after Osaka, or sorry, the same year as Osaka. Perhaps shipping such a large heavy item was also of concern for the plywood crate packed with the cover and poles reinforced with steel consumed 45 hours of labor and weighed about a thousand pounds. These details underscore that the rescaling of Blackman's Lodge stopped short of miniaturization, a process associated with trivialization and possession, and this has a very long history within world fairs. Instead, the lodge retains its status as architecture, and it fell on the small end of Blackfeet teepees designed for dwelling. Photographs of the pavilion suggest that the lodge can help intimate haptic interactions. Visitors touch the flaps of the open door, bend to peer inside, and crane their necks to follow the poles skyward. The concentration of such activities at the entrance to the lodge point to the potential for Congress inside. The open door issued a welcome. And although I don't know if this invitation was ever answered at uh, Expo 70 or beyond, the Colonel TP still presented itself to visitors as habitable and by extension, hospitable. Scale enabled the translation of a key Blackfeet concept into Expo 70, the architectural emplacement of newcomers within a circle of reciprocity that painted teepees were designed to expand. Other decisions shaped the teepees reception in a foreign space. Blackman developed a 25-page illustrated instruction manual with the staff from the museum. The diagrams uh, seem to teach novices in Osaka how to uh, erect the teepee. Normally, these uh, lessons would be transmitted inside the community through observation and mimicry, but now notes and images translate protocols into portable form to bridge significant gaps in time, space, and cultural fluency. One diagram predicts a floor of wood or concrete rather than soil, and it specifies the creation of wooden shoes to be nailed to the floor to prevent the poles from sliding. Another note instructs the users to determine the direction the TV will face. This is um, a breach of protocol, for normally a lodge should face the rising sun, the source of all energy and animation in the cosmos. The manual's authors clearly anticipated disregard for this protocol, perhaps uh, based on aesthetic and design, uh, exhibition design needs. And yet the diagram also exerts the preferences of their maker. For example, um, one uh, uh, dictates that the ear flaps should be pulled open. This is a position that maximizes the visual impact of the constellations painted on, on the flaps but it also ensured the circulation of air, an index of the sun's vitality through the interior of the teepee. And this detail suggests that one aim of the manual was to retain the potential for cosmological activation even under alien conditions of display. 
Bachman went a step further, and I'm showing you the, the best color image I have of it, uh, the keeping in, in front of the museum before it was shipped. He went ahead and attached pendants uh, made of buckskin that were painted bright red uh, into the mouths of each of the crows on the frieze. The medallions mirrored the historical practice of hanging skins and other sacred found materials on lodge exteriors, used to count coup to represent a good deed or to honor an animal gift. These are all uh, possibilities that Pikmin Woman shared with me when I showed her the image. Blackman knew that as the Crow Lodge traveled to Osaka, it would be severed from the stories and protocols that lent it sacred meaning in a Blackfeet universe. And he literalized the most significant feature of the associated story, essentially recreating the hunter's treasured gift of buffalo meat using deer flesh. These small additions had an outsized meaning, for they manifested the intangible principle most in danger of being lost in capitalist translation, that of reciprocity. I suggest that Blackman's inclusion of these elements positioned the lodge to activate, rather than merely picture, new nodes in the circuit of exchange. He took care to translate elements of Blackfeet treaty ecologies into Cold War international relations, where they could make demands of old and new allies alike. The values of hospitality and generosity that I discussed extended a bit further when the lodge was gifted to the city of Osaka at the close of Expo 70. This gift was presented ostensibly by the US government, but Blackman's material interventions beg the question, who exactly was the teepee from and to what ends? For the Crow Lodge stood in tension with progress and harmony for mankind, a future of continued expansion and control that excluded Blackfeet innovators. Those who witnessed the ceremony were left to search the lodge for answers. The avian and celestial figures, the pine bouquet, the open door, the buckskin pendants. I propose, in closing, that the lodge could only be a dual gift from a Blackfeet artist and his crow guardians. The teepee challenge, the dome's dubious claims, with a promise to enfold visitors in a cosmic circuit of more than human reciprocity. As contemporary Native Studies scholars have asserted, Native people have already survived apocalypses of grand proportion in the form of colonization. In the face of continued rather than novel threats to the fundamentals of life, survival is a long game. It is, much the, it is as much the purview of animals and ancestors as avant-garde, and it engages the multiplicity of indigenous temporalities rather than the singular logic of progress. In my view, indigenous futurism might encompass the entire cultural and creative toolkit that native people have used to hold their cosmologies together under siege and dream a future beyond colonial capitalism. Blackman conjured the deep time of crow beings and the generosity of artistic forebears to create a di diplomatic gift. And in doing so, he insisted on the relevance of indigenous art to international relations, and especially the necessity of forging new treaty ecologies to sustain any collective future worth living. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thanks to Emily, thanks to Dave, and thanks to the speakers, thanks to the audience. In the late 1950s and early 60s, as the British Empire unraveled, artists in London faced the Northwest, looking across the Atlantic to the United States. Fascinated by the scale and tone of its industrialized popular cultures, advertising, music, celebrity, artists pay tribute to the newfound global dominance of America, its centrality and advances, its lead. In that show of transatlantic admiration, there was nonetheless found an opportunity to assert a British cultural identity. Pervasive local anxieties about the diminishing status of Britain were channeled into the cultural field 
which made a virtue of Britain's growing belatedness vis-a-vis -vis America. There was embrace of displaced or outsider subjects through the celebration of gay, working class, and Jewish personalities. The persuasive power of such discourses of inclusion rested on a marked contrast, however. One struck with a larger body of artists comprising those of Caribbean, African, and Asian backgrounds and others of the Commonwealth, as well as women. These were not to be the beneficiaries of Britain's but fashionably recuperated take on belatedness, as they could not be associated with its racialized and patriarchal formulation of nativist belonging, and all remained constitutive outsiders to Britain's vaunted contemporary art. We can explore a vivid register of this period through the figure of Caribbean-born painter Frank Bowling, who came to Britain in 1953 to continue his art education, like several other artists of his generation in the post war years. In 1959, he entered the Royal College of Art in London and studied alongside the soon to be canonized figures of British pop art David Hockney, Arvi Kitai, Derek Boschier, and Peter Blake. As a student in London, Bowling's early pieces contributed to Pop's rejection of the legacy of English painting on which the RCA curriculum was founded. Using photographs and anatomical images as a pictorial trigger and aid memoir for his painted figures, they did so by much less gentle departures than his contemporaries who employed collage. Bowling's initial success in the local art world had much to do with the Polish pharmacist and gallerist Mateusz Grabowski, who lived in Britain from 1959. At the Grabowski Gallery in 1962, Derek Boschier and Bowling held their joint show Images in Revolt, and through it they gained the lead on their RCA peers, being the first to exhibit away from the support lens by the format of large group shows. Bowling impressed Norbert Linton with his first exhibition, especially the two versions of a painting and a work entitled Painting 1962, and the triptych, a mirror, three windows, and a door, which was bought by the Kaluste Gulbenkian Foundation. A reproduction of two parts of the Gulbenkian from the painting was carried by Art International, alongside Linton's review. Such work drew the attention of critics, including Lawrence Allowin, David Sylvester. Andrew Forge recognized Bowling as exceptional, strongly praising his triumphal affront to the Baconianism indulged by the artists and the critics of his generation. One panel of the triptych, completed in 1961, was kept by Grabowski and together with several other works by Bowling, went into the collection of the Museum Sztuki in Łódź in Poland, when Grabowski returned there in 1975. In response to a lack of opportunity in Britain, Bowling moved to New York in 1966. There he painted Mother's House and Blazing Canefield with Rumshoff, and soon after, Bartica Born II in 1969, works that declared lines of connection with the newly independent state of Guyana and of Bowling's childhood there. Memories of Bartica and the town where Bowling grew up New Amsterdam, are elaborated by the repeating transfer onto canvas of an image of the Bowling family home, a detail first used in Covergirl, 1962, and a work on paper, Beware of the Dog. A more hidden reference hinges on associations with Bartica as a place of political history. The town has special significance as the nearest settlement to the 17th century Dutch fortress, Kijk over Al which means literally sea over all or lookout, which is now a ruin on a tiny uninhabited island at the confluence of three rivers, the Essequibo, the Matsuruni, and Kuyuni. In his figurative works, Bowling would emphasize the symbolic value of being in America by concentrating his energies on exposing the cultural significance of decolonization. His works called into view a historical microorganism of imperial incursions and trade-offs and the 20th century fallout of empire. In the broader history of decolonization, political independence for British Guyana came belatedly. It came through a process in which an assumption of cultural backwardness, belatedness in a literal sense, was imputed to colonial societies. That was being turned on its head, however, during the early decades that followed the Second World War, and Bowling's art was at the heart of that change. 
While the anti-colonial movement was proving to be geopolitically transformative around the globe, so was the impact of migration on metropolitan experience in the Northern Atlantic. Uh, these of his works made in America um, suggested, um, let me just say that, suggested themes of self-determination, unity, and uplift, so that the building of a new nation in Guyana, as it gained independence in 1966, resonated with the drive to visibility and the assertion of rights and empowerment for black Americans. Yet, it is Bowling's relationship with the possibilities of abstract art which configures the role of belatedness in his wider American career. Turning gradually to abstraction, only after settling in New York, the transition was not simply belated in relation to American modernism, but also in relation to Bowling's initial foray into abstract art, made as early as 1959. As he told me in an interview in, in the year 2006, when accounting for his evolution as an artist over several decades, I quote, even before I started as a student, Carol Waite, who would become Bowling's tutor, came into the room and he saw what I was trying to do. I was trying to paint a dying swan, and he said, you won't last here if you choose to do abstract painting. He probably took me to the pub afterwards and talked about everything else but art. It was my first warning, so I went to the life room to learn how to draw, to handle paint so I could paint figures, because I had things to express. Life and death, that's what my art was about. I naively thought, he went on, I could balance my interest in abstraction. Indeed, when I went to New York, even if I hesitated for a few years, between 69 and, uh, 66 and 69, 70, and then I went ahead, end of quote. Bowling spoke about first being held back from doing abstract work, but then holding himself back from a full shift to abstraction, choosing rather more of a balance, as you put it, with that and, fi and with figuration, as in the later part of the 1960s. At interview, he seemed full of regret for his slowness in trying to strike that balance and for sticking with it. That story was beset at the same time with instances of neglect for his work by the art establishment, such as when he failed to be selected for certain major survey exhibitions and, coll and collections. But more generally, he felt that the belatedness of all British artists in their turn to abstraction presented circumstances robbed of opportunities. He spoke about a sense of isolation in this regard, and as an artist of colour in Britain, which he overcame by finding community among black artists in America who were leading a debate about ethnicity and aesthetics. All this, he explained, will have delayed the recognition he deserved coupled with an over-attention to national culture during the decade of the 1960s that created a kind of recognition gap between the US and Britain. Even in retrospect, curatorial surveys and art historical accounts of this period have cultivated their respective national stories, each location proving unable to acknowledge or value Bowling's achievements on the opposite shore. The year before that 2006 interview, Bowling was elected a member of the Royal Academy here in the UK. And he intimated to me that if, by contrast, some sort of comprehensive transnational recognition should ever come, it would, only, it would be only a bittersweetly belated turn of events after so many decades of neglect and abuse. In the years since 2006, then, and that, that, that interview, there's been a huge breakthrough in according a place to bowling in the history of art, with numerous major exhibitions, prizes, and monographic publications, and the award in, in the UK two honours, an Order of the British Empire in 2008, and a knighthood for bowling in 2020. But bowling's inclusion in the United States uh, of the American story of, of, of the 1970s has been more belated. Some of the problems in contextualizing the artist's American career are on view in the justly acclaimed book published in 2016 by Darby English entitled 1971, A Year in the Life of Color, which presents bowling among his African-American peers, highlighting their choice of abstract over representational art, with case studies on the exhibition's contemporary black artists in America held at the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the deluxe show in a renovated movie theater in a, uh, in a poor neighborhood of Houston. Bowling was at odds with an orthodoxy of the time, 
and which has prevailed since in the view of uh, Darby English, that the sort of art that best responds to the racial struggles and liberation campaigns of civil rights, if not black power, is figurative and narrative. There's probably much more to say on this about why, for instance, a division was drawn in this way, and with these being the only available options. To be noted, then, is that the lasting unease with abstraction in the hands of black American artists may have issued from a different quarter from the discouraging remarks about abstract art in Britain the following described in interview. Even so, together they bear upon the position of advocacy for abstraction that Bowling took up after his move to America. This was clear in Bowling's painting practice, but also his curating and writing. Bowling's essay of 1971, entitled It's Not Enough to Say Black is Beautiful, published in Arts Magazine, was an ambitious attempt to go beyond the imposition of propagandist demands on black artists. It argued that what remains at issue in, in art is aesthetic quality. He, he used the word standards and ability rather than political commitment. As Bowling wrote, the tradition, traditional aesthetic of black art, often considered pragmatic, uncluttered, and direct, really hinges on secrecy and disguise. The understanding is there, but the overwhelming drive is to make it complicated, hidden, acute. I note that while Darby English's book served to put Bowling at the intersection of blackness and modernism, a modern modernist abstraction, it left aside consideration of the artist's Caribbean background, as well as his training and career in Britain. Regretfully, that made for a partial and detached treatment of the subject matter at the heart of the book as well as partiality in recognizing Bowling, Bowling's transnational career. After all, Bowling embodies how the debate over abstraction, racial politics, and representationalism did not begin or end in America. Building on the retrospective exhibition, Frank Bowling, Mapa Mundi, curated by Ockwe and Weiser, and Anna Schneider in 2017, and the House de Kunst in uh, Munich, in 2019, Kate Britton staged a major one-person show of Bowling's paintings that demonstrated why no single national geography is adequate for understanding this art. But belatedness was present even here. A phenomenally wide media response to the exhibition vigorously embraced Bowling's art as some sort of exotic new discovery, and it hinted at a kind of double victory that the Tate exhibition had supposedly ended the many decades of marginalization that black British artists as a community have suffered. I would be drawing a false parallel, I would say, to the moment of the pop in the early 19, early 1960s Britain, when belatedness relative to American modernism was Britain's uh, USP. Because in 2019, the national art system didn't work overtime at all to reclaim and repackage relatedness as a cultural asset. Instead, it was hardly mentioned at all. Now, I've suggested that we may come to understand more fully the British, American, and Caribbean scenes together by assessing the role of relatedness in the historiography of this period, and so exposing some discreetly told, as it were, national art stories to one another. But that list of countries, in my view, is already too small. The final variety of relatedness, which I'll highlight as I draw to conclusion, has more to do with a distinctively outer national story of art. There's been an intellectual slowness to contemplate and go beyond a historiography comprised of national components. You might have noticed um, that I've been able to tell this whole, this entire story, and Bowling's American story, by showing examples from a collection in Poland, you may have seen that in the captions, where they've been since 1975. Well, in Britain, Bowling was immersed in a social setting that involved not only artists of color, as I've noted, but also those people such as Mateusz Grabowski, as well as white artists and curators from elsewhere, such as the gallerist Dennis Bowen from South Africa. 
um, and other uh, individuals from the Commonwealth. It's significant that this has happened, that this happened before the formation of artist groupings based around racial identity. The Caribbean artist movement um, of the later 1960s and early 70s, for example, the black arts movement of roughly the same period in the United States, or the Afro-Asian or black art movement in Britain during the 1990s. Not only does that put, uh, not only does that outer national community put a historical foundation underneath other stories of migration too, those that concern artists who move to and from the United States, but it also suggests why the context of Britain in the 1960s was hardly related at all. With the benefit of hindsight, um, in its interracial, interethnic relationships and exchanges through the visual arts, the period seems oddly familiar. In neither the American or British context have galleries or museums yet begun to dig into these outer national histories. And I see a clear opportunity, I would say here, for curators and historians focusing on the post-war period to take these interacting plot lines and these testimonies and go about telling these stories, doing so despite, but also through, relatedness in its many varieties. Thanks very much. Can you join us in the front? No, but I managed to not fall. Thank you. Thank you both so much for those um, wonderful talks. Um, is this your, oh, you have your water. Okay. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, I will maybe start with one related to the idea that you presented at the end, you know, like the outer national stories. Um, which I think is productive and interesting, and it aligned with a question that I had that traces, I think, both through both of your talks about the way in which transnational mobility um, functions in both of your case studies to offer a sort of productive instability through which objects can sort of challenge and shift the impositional language that is imposed upon them. So is it because of this kind of outer national story or this kind of transnational space of the World's Fair that we can find these um, kind of challenges to um, constructions of belatedness? You are welcome, or I am happy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, I haven't used the phrase, but the sort of the time of the nation and how the nation depends on certain uh, normative conceptions of time, you know, being accepted um, is, you know, re relevant to the, the sort of bisection of this person's career along, you know, sort of, you know, the British story on one side, the American story on another, and clearly there's a third story which is a Caribbean one and possibly a fourth one which is a Polish one, um, and many other stories too. And so I think, I think you're, you know, you're, you're right there to consider the the transnational possibilities. You will know, though, because I know you've done your homework and read my book that I spent quite a lot of time dissecting the idea of the transnational um, and, uh, and trying, in a sense, to, um, to do something with that so that we don't lose sight of the uh, opportunity, political opportunities, to kind of assert an identity, a national identity for someone like Bowling. Um, as a as a British subject, in other words, um, that you know, with sort of a transnational kind of conceptualization doesn't sort of run away with itself, and we end up, as it were, um, kind of rendering you know diasporic people in this in this kind of cosmopolitan sort of space outside of the, the nation, and the reason for that is that you know obviously very compelling arguments that came out of the New Left and so on in Britain about um, blackness and Britishness. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, it's not that there's a tension there, but there's kind of a responsibility to, as it were, to stand up for Bowling's Britishness, if you like. 
but at the same time to understand that we do so in a climate in which there's a kind of tendency to try to celebrate and claim individuals as sort of um, figureheads or, um, you know, a sort of role models, if you like, for one or other uh, given kind of national community. So no one knows better than you, Emily, and I'm thinking about your first book, um, mm -hmm. the power of triangulating nations internationally, um, especially when we're thinking about the indigenous nations within who are always positioned beneath and inside the United States as the powerful sort of uh, patronizing force, right? And so um, uh, Native activists knew this very well during the American Indian Movement and, and long before by um, heading to the United Nations and doing diplomacy work internationally alongside direct activism in the United States. And my book is trying to tell a kind of um, series of, of, of case studies leading up to the American Indian Movement where this ironically happened inside of US government um, uh, Cold War diplomacy initiatives, which we know so much about if you study American art history, um, but the story of um, indigenous artist diplomats within that history hasn't really been told very extensively. And so, for example, um, I, I think there's different possibilities that happen when you triangulate uh, uh, nations um, in, in, uh, through artistic exchange, but um, to, to emphasize Japan for a minute, which didn't get very much space in my talk, um, there was an existing discourse of um, futurism attached to Native American subjects in Japan at the time of Expo 70. Um, the journalists in Japan had named um, scrap thieves on the exterior of the city of Osaka in the late 50s and early 60s many of whom were Korean immigrants, um, uh, the Japanese Apache, and then um, uh, novelists and different uh, radical artists and cultural critics in Japan sort of seized on this idea, um, as well as their uh, sometimes firsthand knowledge of Native Americans who had um, been part of the US military occupation of Japan um, to um, articulate a kind of um, sci-fi futurism. So there were novels about the Japanese Apache who were these like metallic eating cyborgs. Um, so a very different association temporally or a temporal reversal of the kind of stuff that was coming through Hollywood, um, uh, Western films, you know, that the US government was, was circulating in Japan at the time. Um, so you get these kind of, um, uh, the incommensurabilities that I was talking about, not only um, are they sort of embedded in the work that Native artists have done when they know their work will be displaced, right? Um, the kinds of um, coatings and embedded resistances that objects can contain when they travel that, that insist on some cultural continuity despite gaps in time and space, as I was kind of articulating with the manual, the instruction diagrams, um, but also in the, in the context of reception, um, because the, the image of Native Americans as it circulated globally, and as Native people have circulated globally, um, have created these other conditions and other narratives that can then converge around the object. Thank you so much. I just wanted to follow up on the question of the TP in Japan is, um, I was thinking also about the Ainu populations in Japan, and I wondered if they played a role in the expo in 1970, and if there was any kind of transnational indigenous dialogue understood in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the Canadian Pavilion had a group of Inuit carvers who traveled to Osaka, so there were um, uh, other indigenous folks there. I don't know, um, I haven't been able to um, locate any evidence of Ainu uh, participation, but I'm working with um, a Japanese scholar who has been hunting for the Crow Lodge on the ground for me and all kinds of institutions <laughs> abroad, and we plan to collaborate more around these indigenous histories at, at, at Expo 70, so that's one of, one of a series of remaining questions. Thank you so much. I see some hands in the audience. I'll go to Renata and then Anne and then Elizabeth. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to both of you for really interesting papers. 
And really, I wanted just to give you an opportunity oh, sorry, take you <coughs> to expand on, on kind of key, key elements of what you've been presenting. And, and Jessica, you kind of almost answered the question. But let me start with you on um, have you seen the Bowling, Bowling exhibition in Cape Britain? And I was interested in your comment and question about um, how this work might be presented differently through the lens of the many, many versions of the native person who has cited the work. Um, so basically, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to expand on that because, of course, the, the transatlantic connections were mentioned in that exhibition. Yeah. And then to what extent, so, so how would that differ? And then to what extent would it be, because of course this is also the focus on the individual, and to what extent would you basically then have to defocus on the individual, which would also perhaps then yeah. take away the problem of tokenism, which maybe the relatedness angle would also yeah. handle, I don't know. Yeah. So. so your question is, could it have been handled differently? I mean, um, is that what you mean? Uh, the exhibition could have been handled differently. It, but the question is that because you proposed <coughs> this work could be really interested or presented really differently, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to expand because of course some of these connections they were kind of mentioned as you do in a regular exhibition, you know, born there, lived to Britain, went to um, America. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, the connections were there. So basically. How would you envisage doing that differently in a way that gives you a different opportunity to present mm -hmm. the work? And as you well, as a result, I was just curious. Well, uh, I mean, well, what curators have done is they've tended to use, um, sort of borrow some of the analytical, sort of conceptual vocabulary from Caribbean contexts like Edouard Glissant. And ideas about the submarine, submarine connection, archipelagic connections, that sort of thing, um, which seems to work fairly well for the purposes of a public exhibition or program and sort of stitching together, you know, this sort of idea of a, you know, uh, I think the word Emily used there was a kind of cosmopolitanism um, that crosses national boundaries and, you know, encourages us to think about uh, artists um, negotiating conditions of uh, displacement, exclusion, marginalization, and how there's a kind of um, a sort of new world diasporic imaginary that can be used to sort of um, make sense of all of that. So that's very much what curators have been doing with that. Um, some art historians, uh, Kay Kiahain has done very well in exposing um, how um, you know, glissant has kind of been used and and sort of misused in, in the sense that a superficial sort of, you know, borrowing appropriation of, of just some fragments of his, um, not, it's not totalizing kind of philosophy, but of his extensive philosophical work for, you know, for, for, for those sorts of ends by curators. You know, there's kind of smash and grab on, on them. So, but I mean, who am I to criticize? It work, It seems to work very well, and it worked very well in the Tate show um, to sort of um, overlay a kind of, you know, post-colonial theoretical diasporic kind of lexicon on this, because for the most part, that's really what audiences are taught. To, these are new art audiences to this art, and they're not. They're not really. Um, you know, familiar with those, and the, and then it becomes more expansive, and then we enter this new other realm, which is where we can start to think about or ask questions about who are the who are these other artists of the Caribbean or um, uh, Black British artists, um, artists of diasporic backgrounds in Britain, and what do they have in common with um, other artists of color, um, indigenized artists, and and so on. So that's kind of quite effective, but you know, my role in like as an art historian, it's just kind of lift the lid on all of that and try to try to sort of evaluate that because I think there are some gains to be made there, and that conceptualization is done for the purposes of public programming and exhibition. But you know, I'm writing for a different for a different sort of purpose. Um, yeah, I mean, one way to cope with this is to draw out 
the complexities of a term of like relatedness and look at it in relation to provincialism, which is like, I, th I think what I've tried to do um, numerous times, so not only to think about the politics of temp time and temporality, but to also think about geopolitical and, and um, spatial sorts of questions in relation to what are considered to be the sort of discursive kind of homelands of contemporary art and the extent to which even when you choose to highlight tokenistically or otherwise an artist like Bowling within a metropolitan center, you're still faced with, with not a problem of geography, but a kind of a problem of um, temporality. And that's why you know, I've tried to sort of um, ex explore that more carefully. Um, but yeah, there are other artists that one should really bring into the picture in order to better understand bowling, I think. So work of typical work of art historical graphical kind of comparison, you know, with Aubrey Williams, for example, would work. And that's exactly what sort of took me to Poland in January to the Museum um, Stucki and Wuch, where they had this show of works by uh, Williams, three of which are in the collection, have been since 1975, thanks to Mateusz Grabowski, alongside you know, many, several others, uh, and to bring them together with a Polish artist, Erna Rosenstein, um, and to bring, you know, to look at those new kinds of juxtapositions, to explore ideas of multi-directional memory, and you know, bring the whole thing more, maybe more into memory studies than into um, post-colonial kind of theoretical frameworks. Thank you. If I could very quickly, no questions to this, but maybe you answer the question because I was very interested in your reference to indigenous futurism. Mm -hmm. So, did you mean by that the dimension in Osaka, or is there another also you have on that? Um, well, that's certainly a, a, a rich context that I explore in the chapter, the longer chapter of the book. Um, the, the specific um, Osaka Japanese construction of a, I mean, it's, it's still an appropriation, right? It's a, it's a futurism for, um, for oppressed Japanese and those who Jap Japan has colonized more so than it is directly about uh, Native Americans. But there's a kind of attempt to create a sympathetic alignment, right? Um, uh, that that help, helped me to um, articulate a, a position that, I've been slowly developing, and it's kind of going to happen more after the book at this point, I think, um, where I want to think of more about historical um, or customary arts as, um, uh, as, as critical to the, um, the possibility of indigenous futures and, and, and as a kind of futurism. Um, the discourse of indigenous futurism has been very closely tied, no surprise, to science fiction writing by native authors um, and to slipstream and so on. Uh, but Grace Dillon, the indigenous um, scholar who's, who's one of the sort of first to, to think very seriously about indigenous futurism and kind of founding, founding that discourse in many ways, um, speaks about how um, native slipstream thinking has been around for millennia. So it can't be thought outside of, you know, an ancestors who were already doing this work and the different kinds of creative forms that have carried those ideas, you know, a, a, across time, however we arrange it. Um, and so, uh, especially under conditions of um, such intense colonial siege, um, uh, every every creative act and creative work um, that uh, that that however adapted, however radically changed, forges a continuity with indigenous knowledge and with ancestral knowledge is a, is a to me a radical form of indigenous futurism. And I know you can kind of that, that can get sloppy <laughs> if it gets too big, um, but those are some of the ideas I've been playing with. Um, and and because there was. Because the future and because futurism was the question both in Japan and for the United States and other participants in Expo 70, it seemed like a more grounded place to start to explore that question. Thank you both for your excellent papers. Um, and actually, my question is for Jessica, and I think builds on the question that was just asked about futurism. And uh, as you know, at the um, Expo uh, Osaka in 1970, um, there were at least two major um, additional exhibitions by American organizers 
that very much focused on sort of futuristic art. And I'm thinking specifically of what experiments in art and technology did with their pavilion, which also um, involved the creation of a huge dome that actually created these um, virtual three-dimensional images. And then I'm also thinking about Maurice Tuckman's art and technology installation, um, for which he actually delayed slightly the show that he did in Los Angeles in order that it be um, off, that pieces from that first be presented in Osaka. So I was just curious whether you were aware of any sort of discourse that might have happened um, between um, uh, the organizers of the um, uh, installation of Plains Indian work and uh, Maurice Tuckman or artists involved with art and technology and or EAT. And just in terms of this question of modes of temporality as the United States was sort of presenting American culture. Um, and again, sort of back to the importance of temporality, whether that was a topic that was recognized and bridged um, at that time. Um, I've worked on the A&T and EAT installations, but so I'm not aware of that, but perhaps you are. I'd just be curious what your thoughts are about those really interesting juxtapositions of aspects of American art, culture, and history at this particular world fair. So thank you. Mm, thanks so much. I mean, I'll just say, Briefly, because um, it sounds like your, your your knowledge and work on those other exhibitions has gone much deeper than mine. I read sort of read the read the literature um, in order to sort of frame um, the, in a lot of ways the figure of the dome and its kind of techno futurist um, um, the discourses and the ways in which it embodies a certain vision of that and all of its of course ties to NASA and to corporations and so on. Um, so that's sort of a longer conversation in the book, thinking about the teepee and the dome side by side as um, each making, and they appear constantly side by side. So thinking about the kind of different claims they both make to circularity framed by whole earth images in this period and by different architectural possibilities for inhabiting extreme climates, which of course the dome is um, designed to do for both military and climatic reasons. Um, but yes, I don't, I can't speak um, uh, in much more detail about whether back alley conversations happened about how those exhibitions would resonate. Uh, Je Jessica, yeah. when, sorry. Jessica, when you mentioned that the TP and the dome, are you speaking about the pneumatic covering that you referenced um, in your talk? Um, is that what you meant by dome or was it the EAT dome? It, Oh, I, I said um, TP. Sorry, I can't remember if I said used a singular or plural, but I should have said teepees and domes appeared side by side continuously in this period. Um, and I'm thinking, yeah, much more broadly than the fair. Oh, okay. And then actually, yeah. so the, what I wanted to understand is with respect to the fair and publicity around it, did you notice a juxtaposition between those items in terms of? Um, whether it was art reviews or publicity about the fair, was that juxtaposition being made um, mm. at that moment in time? Um, I can't think of a, of a very interesting example okay. of publicity, but of course the TV sat on the third, on the third tier, so it was literally pointing to the the mnemonic ceiling. The the yeah. The elliptical dome ceiling. So they were quite literally juxtaposed um, in the space. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. And I may to Elizabeth and then across the aisle. I'm going to try to be brief, especially because I have another question for Jessica. Um, uh, first, a comment. I, I wonder whether the fact that Osaka is also the home of the National Ethnographic Museum. Um, influences the um, interest in ethnographic others um, in that particular location in addition to the futurist point of view. But um, my question is, um, in triangulating cultures, what I didn't hear from you and perhaps you thought about is, um, what are native perceptions of Japan? Does black men have an understanding of, uh, of Japan as a site for his work? I'm thinking particularly in terms of the ecological, imaginary, appealing, or reciprocity of Japan, of course, in this period. The Cold War is 
you know, a kind of vital site for imagining recovery um, or apocalypse. So just to know whether because so many Native people were veterans of World War II or, you know, on the front lines in, in, in very real ways in the Cold War, whether you have um, any access to the perception there. Yeah, that's, that's great. And that's a, a question I ask in all of my chapters that's much easier to answer in the cases where the artists themselves traveled, which is true of almost every other chapter. So this one is a little bit, not only did black men pass almost immediately after the event, so I've been able to interview community and family, um, uh, uh, and you know that specific memories of what black men thought or spoke about Japan didn't come up. But um, I do try to get at that question sideways because of the writing of Gerald Weisner, Yanishinabe, um, a, a cultural theorist and a novelist who has an incredible um, novel about, um, he, he himself was in Japan uh, during the occupation in the military and uh, wrote a novel about um, a, uh, the offspring of a Japanese uh, woman and a, actually not a new woman uh, and um, and uh, um, and a native um, uh, soldier or person who was um, stationed in Japan at the time who grows up in the kind of shadow of the bomb in Japan and like draws the connections between um, particular. Um, U.S. narratives around peace and the kind of violence lurking under the surface. Um, so having Weisner in the mix kind of helps me to um, to talk about the yeah the possibility right of these transnational imaginations going all all directions. Thank you both very much. Um, can I just put a very general proposition to you and ask you to comment if you want to comment on it to do with time and space? Because um, it may be that in colonial situations or dealing with provincialism or conversely dealing with exile of refugee artists and the like, there is a, some sort of tension between being away from what might be seen as center or the previous prevailing culture, automatically brings with it a time gap. So there is a relationship between those people who are far away from the dominant culture and who feel behind the dominant culture. There is also often a nostalgia in other words, are looking back in something to what a dominant culture may be or a home culture may be. So, is belatedness an automatic consequence of being displaced in some way? Don't feel obliged. And it may be obvious and it's also a thought, or it may be not. Jessica. Oh, but it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. In the Caribbean uh, uh, context that I've thought about a little bit, um, the yeah we could, we have a situation where um, the reception of artists from the Caribbean in the former imperial metropole is beset by uh, conditions or imputations of belatedness, you know, backwardness. Um, I, I would that I haven't used today, but anachronism as well. For example, when an artist uh, sort of turns up and insists on doing um, abstract work that's more uh, readily associated with the period of uh, modernist primitivism of the early 20th century, and in fact the date is like 1952, then straight away the, the, the you know, the, the, the kind of, you'll, we'll start to hear about how um, those individuals have kind of come too late. So, when I first encountered that, what my response as an art historian was to try to sort of assert the modernism of those artists. Say, look, they're not behind the times, they're not unfashionably late, they're doing this for their own reasons, there's contingency here upon their, uh, you know, uh, diverse conditions, if you like, of um, colonization, the politics of decolonization and everything. 
And then I started to think, well, actually, that's kind of a slightly futile task. Um, uh, laying all your sort of cards on, on the table and saying, look, this is, well, what I need to do is be more transparent about it and say, what artists were doing is they were acutely aware of the conditions of their reception. But then out of and within those conditions, they had to find the kind of the resources um, and the means, the ideas, the, you know, the, the sort of um, materials to tackle and negotiate you know, this condition of relatedness. So whether it's automatic or not, when it's a trans-historical phenomenon, I don't know. But what we do find is across different colonial spaces, we do get a similar sort of response. Uh, I mean, well, be a similar sort of response within the metropolitan center to artists, regardless of what colonial space they've come from. They always seem to be a little bit behind the times. And that's very true of the early uh, decades of the post-war era period. But it's also true today. So, um, you know, for example, when artists from the Caribbean show their work um, as they did a, a landmark museum in Brooklyn, you know, Holland Cotter pops up, a New York Times critic, and, and says, ah, identity politics, again, but we've done that already. We did that last, we did that in the 1980s uh, in New York City. And so there's always this kind of relegation of the contribution that could be made to, to people. Uh, the, you know, people from, uh, you know, outside the metropole, as it were, to the past. Um, and that, that kind of just keeps repeating um, uh, uh, under the terms of, say, global contemporary art, which is meant to be a completely inclusive category in which everything is kind of horizontal. And you can make global contemporary art regardless of where you are in the world. And in fact, you know, there's still, there are still these kind of arbiters of taste and value which play out, which have this very, um, the quality of a, a kind of temporal, tem temporal judgment about, um, about place, literally place of those artists, within a quite normative idea of the history of art, as one, you know, which the kind of, you know, isms and movements kind of, you know, they su styles supersede others and, the, you know, sensibilities kind of give way to new sensibilities. And, and the, the, the Caribbean presence kind of seems to challenge all of that, but it causes, in a sense, that sort of um, normative, kind of reactionary, quite conservative, quite linear um, sort of uh, formulation to kind of re-emerge, uh, out of which the artists have got to find um, a way through. And they do, and they do so in like a million different ways. And that, that's, that's been one of my main interests. That's a good question. It's got me, got me talking. So without wanting to um, um, deny. In fact, I want to embrace the the, um, the disruptive and the multiplicity that can accompany the notion of belatedness. But um, what came to mind for me, for better or for worse, um, when you raised your question, was the um, you know one one of the major grounds for indigenous displacements, whether it's of cultural belongings or of people, is, um, has been since the late, since the 19th century, um, United States assimilation policy, and it's all about belatedness, right? It's all about um, wanting to instill the desire in Native people to catch up to um, normative, you know, wage-earning United States capitalist culture. And the explicit narrative during the Cold War that the United States spread through the US Information Agency abroad was, um, you know, we, we really messed up in the past, but now we're giving Native people the opportunities that they were denied, you know, the century, a century ago. Um, that's almost word for word. <laughs> um, and so, yes, to create this desire for a kind of aspirational catching up. And um, so I'm deeply cynical, of course, and I, I know we, we've all voiced different kinds of cynicism today about the way in which belatedness functions in the service of empire, right? Um, and that one is so prominent that I haven't found my way around another answer <laughs> where it can function differently uh, in, in the kind of um, affective sense that you were asking about. 
Um, Thank you so much for your rich talks. I have one or two different questions for Jessica. I am thinking about two pictures you showed. Uh, the one that a, a woman on the expo wants to touch the TP, and the other one is a blank TP. So uh, my question is about the intersection between materiality and visuality. Mm -hmm. And I would assume, please correct me, that the traditional material would be an animal skin of this type of wountable, foldable architecture. And then you said if a teepee is not painted, to use this word, it's um, nothing special, so to speak. So how these two, the materiality and visuality, uh, work, work together in terms of temporalities, also of intersection. If it's an animal, then there was a, a life of an animal, and then there are other non-humans depicted, or some cosmological also signs, and like how it's signified through material and, and, and visual part. And the other one, I was thinking about uh, the authorship, the question of authorship, when the indigenous artists were not allowed to sign their works. So to what kind of temporalities these people then are assigned? So thank you so much. Thank you. Those are great questions. I don't know if I can answer all of it. Um, the, the sort of um, juxtaposition of the plain, the plain white tent and the tabernacle was a, a quote from a um, uh, a Blackfeet elder, Howard Rise at the Door, who um, was an artistic partner and close friend of Daryl Blackman's when they were younger. Um, so, uh, and I don't know, um, you know, he's speaking of a period and lived through a period in which um, uh, white TVs were being mass produced. Um, and uh, so, and, and they were being mass produced in canvas. And there were some native-owned companies that sprang up to answer the needs not only of white consumers, but also of native families during the period for the um, sudden massive increase in demand for teepees. Um, so Howard may have been referencing this kind of um, uh, vast, you know, kind of corporate <laughs> version of, of the Plains teepee, which is fully canvas at this time. Um, canvas uh, was a, a sort of annuity or otherwise trade good that, um, that um, was taken up uh, by, by Plains teepee makers in the 19th century. Um, and so uh, I, would, I would definitely not match um, canvas to contemporary or, you know, uh, buffalo to historical or something of that, or traditional necessarily, because um, uh, this sort of tradition of experimentation has been so long and so ongoing. Or yeah. the settler animal. Of course, yeah, and now it's right iconic of the war, of the warrior figure, and so yeah, I mean um, these these divisions um, break down, and along with them, the settler temporalities that order them so neatly in time and allow a kind of imperial nostalgia to be attached to the buffalo hide teepee and the plains horsemen, ironically, right? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm is there. Remind me, remind me of where I'm at, and authorship. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a really interesting moment, this kind of 60s, 70s moment, because um, there's all these this this efflorescence of um, um, craft industries. Although I'm self-conscious because I'm looking at Elizabeth Hutch Hutchinson right now, who has written about this for a long time, much much earlier periods, but. Um, uh, the United States government, through the these Department of Interior museums, was um, you know including uh, one in Browning, Montana, which is Daryl Blackman's hometown that you saw pictured. The Museum of the Plains Indian um, is creating these um, sort of centers for the production of craft as an economic project, and it's part of an economic project of assimilation that ironically creates the conditions for Native artists to. 
um, uh, to, to um, uh, either relearn or continue to make ancestral, ancestrally informed items. Um, but it is, uh, these industries are very much craft industries, right, um, in, the, in the dominant sense. Um, and so a teepee gets categorized differently than, you know, the Dakota painter Oscar Howe's um, modernist painting in the period. Um, we do see a lot of named indigenous artists um, working at this time, but we also see this sort of um, uh, massive um, government-sponsored um, craft industry growing at the time as well, and that work tends to be unnamed. so much for this question and for that discussion. We'll move ourselves to our reception now. Um, and we have about 45 minutes to continue conversations with the speakers. And one question that I've been bouncing around um, through these talks and kind of connecting with Alexis's talk earlier about space is kind of thinking about what time it is in abstraction um, in various contexts that you've presented. Um, so thank you again uh, to our speaker. <laughs> the audience for your questions and also I wanted to point out our wonderful colleague Acacia Fenbell who's sitting in the back of the room. Thank you so much Acacia for all of your work and management and contribution to the success of the day. Thank you. Okay, please join us just uh, in the reception room. So,